I was working the night shift when it happened. I patrolled all the little sections in the park for wildlife disturbance and vandalism in the dark. That's what most people with bad intentions come out to do. It was really quiet one night when my radio went off, saying that there had been reports of screaming over by B campsite, right near the forest. When I arrived, it had stopped, but the people there were still shaken up, and they had reported this loud growling and guttural sounds coming out of the trees. Of course, when I got there, they were all standing around the fire, but nobody was talking or anything just before their screams, which had woken everybody up. People at Campsite B said they also saw somebody running across the road in front of them, only to disappear in the brush. This had occurred between Campsites A and C. They too stopped their car to investigate what was going on. It happened so quickly that nobody could really get a good look. People from Sida said something ran past them too and started screaming. They could not tell what it was, and none of these people knew each other, nor had they met before this trip. They were all just random folks spending a weekend at the park. So, I followed the path that whatever had run across to see if I could find any tracks or anything. It was nearly impossible. All the ground was so hard, and there were lots of people milling about. The campsite for B is near a bunch of dense woods within the park, so it wasn't too surprising something made its way over there. I checked out campsite since it was next and the closest to where the paths had crossed, but again, nothing turned up. The whole experience felt really strange. Everybody seemed genuinely freaked out outside their tents, but they wouldn't talk much at all. They just kept staring into the black trees with their flashlights, looking for something, waiting for something to come out of the darkness. It was definitely eerie and extremely quiet. I kept my radio on me, thinking we would hear something, but we never did. Although the time I was there, I did not hear anything out of the ordinary. That night, we went home a few hours before sunrise since most people were still awake. The next day, everybody at that campsite packed up pretty quickly, leaving as fast as they could. I guess I had heard from the overnight ranger that this campsite saw something that terrorized their tent. I haven't really heard much about it since then, but apparently, whatever they saw really spooked them. It's a darn shame. I hope whatever it is does not drive traffic away, and people do enjoy camping all year round, so hopefully, whatever large animal this is goes away on its own. I'm hoping it's just maybe a moose or something, and that maybe these people just got spooked. It is the woods, after all, and people's nerves are a lot more on edge when they're out in the darkness or encountering things they don't quite understand. Hey, my name is Levy. I've never done this before, but people need to know what's out there. It's likely that you've heard of such monsters as Skinwalkers, Wendigo, Bigfoot, but you choose to believe that creatures of that kind could never roam the Earth, that humans are the top of the food chain, that we rule this planet. Though comforting, this mindset will not save you when you come face to face with a nightmare. When you realize how weak and helpless you truly are, it will be too late my long-distance girlfriend Tay, who is studying on the other side of the country, was visiting her parents in my town. It was my first time meeting them, and it went the way everyone wants it to go. I don't mean to brag, but they loved me, and they were really nice. When it got late and I was getting ready to go home, Tay's mom offered for me to stay while Tay was in town so that we could spend as much time as possible together until she has to go back to school. Tay looked at me excitedly, and I asked, are you sure? I don't want to be a burden, nonsense levy, Tay's mom says. We think you and Tay are perfect together, and we know how much she misses you when she's gone. Make the most of each other, Tay hugs her mom, and then pulls me and her dad into the hug. It was a beautiful moment, but I can't look at it now without it being tainted by the events that followed. The next few days were perfect. I spent more time with Tay than I ever had before. It was hard with her being so far away most of the time. FaceTime can only do so much to quench the emptiness I felt without her. But for these few days life felt complete. I hung out with her family, 
We played card games for hours. I helped her dad fix his motorbike. Well, I say helped. I mostly just held the flashlight and handed him tools. But I think I won him over that day. He probably would have gave me his blessing in marriage if I had asked. That night we were all sat around the TV watching the new Lightyear movie, which was surprisingly good. I'd be lying if I said I didn't shed a few tears, around 11.18 p.m. when the movie finished. Tay's parents said goodnight and headed off to bed and a couple of Tay's friends who had been visiting said goodbye and drove home. I got up to get some water from the kitchen, and as I walked back I stood in the doorway that separated the kitchen from the living room, which was dark, only lit by the TV, allowing me to see Tay frozen, staring towards the window which was out of my direct line of sight. Confused, I peeked my head out of the doorway and looked toward the window. I froze and dropped my glass. Luckily it landed on the carpet and didn't make much of a noise, and the giant pale creature standing an inch from the window didn't notice. The creature was foul, a gaunt lanky humanoid. Well at least the head and torso was humanoid. It had no legs. The torso ended in a stump. The body was being held up by four arms, each one probably two meters long. The creature's whole body was covered in gray skin stretched tightly over its abnormally long bones. T. He thing had no hair anywhere. Its mouth was strangely wide, stretching around to where its ears would be if it had them. And its eyes were just sunken in kai black pits in its head. But I could tell it was just staring at Tay, who had tears rolling down her face. She slowly turned her head to look at me. She was shaking and breathing quickly. Levy. She whimpered, help. I had never felt so powerless. I'm a six foot two, lean but muscular 20 year old guy. I was supposed to protect her. I always thought I could, and I would die to protect her, but I had no idea how to protect her from whatever this thing was. Then I had an idea. I looked to the light switch panel to my left. I knew one of them was the porch light, but there were three others, the living room light, the kitchen light and the hall light. If I press the wrong light, I don't know what the thing will do, but I had to try. I had to remember. Which light did I see Tay's dad use to turn the porch light on when he went out last night? I reached for the light second from the bottom and flicked the switch. The hall light turned on. Luckily, the hall is on the opposite side of the kitchen to where the living room is, and it is out of view for the creature at the window. But I can't mess up again. If the kitchen light turns on, the creature will see me. And if the living room light turns on, it might cause it to attack Tay. I looked back to the creature, which was reaching using one of its hands to scratch the window. I had to do something. I reached for the bottom light switch and flicked it. The porch light turned on. The creature spun around to face it and let out a screech that will haunt my nightmares for the rest of my life. I ran to Tay and grabbed her dragging her off the side of the couch where there was about a meter gap between the armrest of the couch and the wall. And I held her. What else could I do? I can't fight the thing. We can't outrun it. Does Tay know how scared I am? Can she feel my heart running laps in my chest? I want her to feel safe, like nothing can hurt her when I'm there. But that's clearly not true. The sound of the window smashing fills the house and Tay cries into my shoulder. I hold her tightly. I kiss the top of her head and I wait quietly. I can't see anything. It's pitch darkness besides the slight blue glare from the TV on the wall above us. But I can hear raspy breathing and bones cracking as the thing searches the living room. I hear it sniffing the couch where Tay was sitting. And I hear it make its way closer to the end of the couch. One of its hands pressed on the wall above us. The closer it gets, the less scared I become. All that fear is replaced by anger. This thing wants to hurt the person I love with all of my heart. It wants to take the one thing that makes me happy. I would die for this girl, and I will die for this girl. I kiss her one more time and get myself into a defensive position so that I can easily tackle it before it reaches Tay. And as I see the silhouette of its head begin to peek over the side of the couch, suddenly the light turns on and Tay's dad yells as he sees us from the kitchen while he's holding a shotgun. The creature runs at him, but falls to the ground as one of its arms is obliterated at the shoulder. 
After Tay's dad fires a shot, the creature shakes around on the ground like a fly without wings. Before it grabs the TV in one of its hands and flings it effortlessly at Tay's dad sending him flying into the kitchen counter behind him. The creature quickly sprints out of the window and unleashes a final screech as it disappears into the tree line behind the house. And here we are. I'm sitting at the hospital with Tay and her family. Her dad has a broken jaw, two of broken collarbones, six cracked ribs, two broken vertebrae in his back and a broken pelvis. He's sleeping right now due to the meds he's on, but he's supposed to recover, though he likely won't be able to walk for a while, if ever again. This whole thing happened around five hours ago. It's 4.38 a.m. as I'm writing this. The police left a while ago after telling us we can't go back to the house for a while. I don't know what that thing was, but it's safe to say we are not the dominant species in this world. There are things bigger than us, stronger than us, things you couldn't dream of. You think you can protect yourself, your family. The only difference between you and a rabbit being hunted by a wolf is that the rabbit knows that it's in danger and the rabbit is running for its life. I was laying down in the truck at a pilot truck stop about nine miles south of Eshtabula, Ohio on October 3, 2018 at 1 p.m. I always cover my windows to keep all lights out and lock all the doors. I had backed in, so the front of my truck was facing the storefront. Typically, I'm out by 11.30 p.m., but I kept getting a ringing sound in my right ear and was having trouble with my knee previous injury, unrelated. The last thing I remember is starting the truck around 12.30 a.m. to let the heat run. Then, it seemed almost instantly I was floating onto a table. The table felt high up, maybe five, six feet. I couldn't move anything. My head was turned to my right shoulder. It felt locked there. I was overwhelmed with fear and could feel myself attempting to cry out for help. Two very small 3.54 foot gray skinned creatures were to my right that I could see. Everyone describes gray aliens differently than these guys looked. Their entire body was stubby and their heads were almost too short for their eyes, which were very large like other people described. It was more over the shape of their face that looked different than typical photos you see. The photos you typically see show them elongated in the face. These two looked like it was almost smushed down and like they were squinting with wrinkles between the eyes. I couldn't speak or cry out, but I started to realize what was going on. So I thought in my head best way to describe it for them to please help me relax. I understood what was going on, but I could not calm down. Once I thought that, I could move my arms. So I reached out towards one with my right arm and it held my hand. I did the same with my left arm, and although I couldn't see it, something grabbed my left hand. Their hands were very soft but cold and felt kind of like a toddler's hand. Once I was holding with both my hands, I could not stop smiling. I was completely relaxed, and all I could feel was happiness. The one holding my hand on the right, I believe, is the one who was talking to me. It asked if I was sure that I wanted to remember this time, and I told it I was not sure. It was then that I realized that I'd been visited several times before. I believe the first time was when I was five. I recalled a small devil-like creature coming through the wall of my room. I had a bunk bed with no bottom bed, and it just floated straight up to my face. I immediately screamed. My dad came running in and found me in the far corner by my closet door. Being a kid, I told him the devil came for me. Now that I'm older, I realize it wasn't a devil. It was one of those creatures. The next incident wasn't until I was nine to ten years old. As I was going upstairs to bed, I stopped at the landing. Outside of the window, there was a saucer-shaped disc silver in color with a large orange dome on top of it. I thought that I had immediately gone downstairs to get my dad. But when I went to go get him to tell him what happened, he asked what I was doing still up. Apparently, I had been upstairs for almost an hour. I thought it was only a matter of seconds. After telling my dad what had happened, 
He grabbed our old VCR camcorder, went upstairs with me, and videotaped this craft which was still hovering outside the window. After about 10 to 15 seconds, it shot off and was gone. My dad went downstairs and called Airborne Express, which is the local DHL type company that was in business at the time. He reported the incident to them as well as Wright Patterson Air Force Base. No one reported seeing it, they said that nothing was showing up on radars around that time and that it was probably a coincidence. However, the next morning when we woke up nothing was on the tape whatsoever. On top of that, we had a large pine tree outside of that window. It was lying on the ground and completely black on one side like it immediately burnt partially and then died. There was no other scaring to the ground. Back to the present. So I'm laying on the table and I can feel other hands around me on my legs, arms, ears, and then I feel a hard pressure around my genitals. Like a pump, but with pain like heat, pain. I'm completely distracted while all this is going on though because the creature to my left is now alone. It's just me and him in my view. He's telling me all kinds of things about meeting me in the past, but I can't recall what he was saying. I do recall him saying that I would forget things if I wasn't ready, and unfortunately, he had no control over whether or not I would remember. He could only allow me to remember what I wanted to remember. About the time that I really calmed down and stopped feeling like I was going to have a heart attack, everyone was gone. I woke up in the truck laying on my back on top of my blankets. The truck was still running, but every light on the dash was lit up and alarms were going off on it. So I shut it off thinking it was overheating. I turned it back on a couple seconds later and everything was fine. The whole ordeal did not come to me until after I realized the truck was okay. I immediately started freaking out, and then I heard the same voice again telling me everything was okay and he would see me soon. I feel like over the years I have developed a friendship possibly with this creature, but I'm not sure of that. Honestly, I'm not really sure I even believe myself. However, I can tell you that those other two instances definitely did occur when I was younger and I always wanted to know why they happened. I've always had an interest in aliens, but nothing more than any other young boy does. I've never fantasized about being abducted. I've honestly been freaked out about the thought of it, so I don't think that my mind is playing tricks on me or that I had a dream. Another note to add is I do not think that these creatures had a gender. The only reason why I say that is the voice in my head that was talking to me did not appear to be male or female. I did wake up with a slight nosebleed in my right nostril. I had a headache and continued to have a headache all day. I had very uncomfortable pressure internally. I do not drink alcohol. I do not do drugs. And to the best of my knowledge, I have no mental illness from either side of my family that is known. I have never been a sleepwalker and I don't tend to have very many nightmares. I wish I could remember more of what happened. Although I would definitely be terrified if this occurs again, I hope that I can be more open to it when it does though. I know they will be back because I recall the creature saying it would see me again. The beginning of the encounter was very intrusive and it felt embarrassing. They seemed to just do what they needed to do and then they comforted me. I will say that I agree with others about the whole pure love feeling. I definitely felt as though it possibly genuinely cared about me. I'm not entirely sure that it did, but it was a very comforting feeling. One other thing I do recall it asking me was if I remembered them fixing me when I ruined my ability to reproduce. I didn't answer that I'm aware of, but I think I know what they were talking about. When I was on a deployment to Iraq, we would restart the radars standing in range of them. We were warned if we did that we could become sterile. So I used to do it every day joking that I did not need to have any more kids, as I had already had three at the time. I did wake up several nights with nosebleeds in Iraq, but in my opinion, I believe at least most of those were due to the desert air. I hope my story will help in some way, shape, or form. These are not all of the details of this event. I'm not very good at writing out things, and I only wanted to write out what I was sure of.
I looked at the frayed end of my puppy's leash and sighed. The leash had been thrown in with the kennel I bought when I bought Picard, my Pomeranian. It had been old and ratty, but I figured it would work just as well as a new one. Apparently, I was wrong. I'd only had Picard for two months. The leash was dead, and he was having a grand time somewhere in the woods behind my apartment complex. He was a good puppy, but also a hyperactive one, and I was worried he would wear himself out and get lost. So I pushed through the undergrowth in the direction that he had scampered off. Picard, I called out. Come on, boy. It's going to be nighttime. You need to come get dinner. It had been half an hour, and I was starting to get a little bit worried and a little bit upset. I didn't know what I would do when I found the little guy, but at this point I was just hoping I would find him at all. The sun hadn't completely set, but it would in less than an hour, and after I found Picard I would have to find my way back out of the woods. From the road or the apartments, the mass of trees looked quaint and contained, but from inside of it the forest seemed huge and imposing. Some of the trees had long scratches on them, usually a few feet above my head, or places a little lower where the bark had been torn off in ragged strips. All the branches up to about eight feet high had been broken off and piled around the bases of the trees, and I wondered who had done it and why. It must have taken days of effort for some landscaper to accomplish, and for what purpose? As far as I knew, no one came out here, not even the kids who lived in the apartments. Come to think of it, I hadn't even seen any animals in the woods since I moved in. I'd never noticed it, but now that the thought had entered my head, it was unsettling. Even if the forest was too small for deer, shouldn't there be squirrels or possums or something? I took another look at some of the scratches high on the trees. What were they? Most of them were groups of two parallel lines, gouged deep into the living wood of the trees. Bears had more than two claws, I knew that. Was it something done by whomever had broken off the low branches? I reached up to touch an overhanging branch. It was just out of reach. I was a tall guy, six feet even. Most people wouldn't be able to reach the branches. Maybe the manager of the apartments didn't want people climbing the trees. Picard, here puppy, let's go get a treat. I didn't want to be here anymore. I wanted to take my dog and go home. The sun was getting very low in the sky, and I absolutely did not want to be in these woods after dark. There couldn't be anything to worry about. Nothing scarier than skunks lived in my state. But at this point, I no longer cared. This place was wrong somehow, and even the squirrels knew it. Picard, come. I heard dead leaves rustle behind me. I turned to look. Picard, good do. It wasn't Picard. The thing I saw was tall, eight feet at least. The branches overhead brushed its wolf-like ears. It was covered in thick fur, gray and mossy green, and it stood on two feet like a person. For a brief instant, I thought it must be a Bigfoot, but then I looked at its face, into its eyes, its four eyes. They were small and crimson, arranged in a band across its face where a human's nose would be. Its wide frog-like mouth split, and its entire head seemed to gape open to reveal hundreds, thousands, of teeth like knitting needles as a thick tongue like a twisted handkerchief thrust out and licked slowly across its lips. It took a horrible shuddering step towards me, and I took two back. It blinked, each eye from left to right taking a turn in sequence. Then it raised its long, long arm towards me. I felt my back hit against a tree and thought, Maybe I could climb up, wait for this thing to leave, for someone else to come, even though I knew no one would. But there were no branches in reach, and I suddenly realized why. I shouted at the thing to stop, but it ignored me. It took another step towards me, then a third, its paw outstretched with two thick curved claws extended. I closed my eyes. There was nothing I could do. Then I heard a low whine and a bark. Picard. Great. Not only was this thing going to eat me, but my little dog too. I opened my eyes and started to shout at Picard to run, but the thing was standing there covering its ears. Picard barked again, and the creature howled in what seemed like pain. 
Picard began barking incessantly, frantically, and the horror fled, running deeper into its terrible woods. Picard trotted over to me, his tail wagging, the other end of the leash still clipped to his collar. What a good boy, Picard. What a good boy. I hugged him close. We were both shaking as I tied the two ends of the leash together, and we ran home in the dark. Sometimes, from my window, I watch the woods. I never see animals, but sometimes there are new scratches, high on the trees. And when my neighbor complains about Picard barking in the night, I just smile and nod and apologize, and slip my dog an extra treat. I still remember the day I lost my friend, Mike. We were on a Navy SEAL mission in Wyoming, tracking down a terrorist cell that had a hidden base in the mountains. We were hiking through the snow when we heard a loud explosion. We turned around and saw a huge fireball engulfing our chopper. It had been hit by a rocket launcher. We knew we had to get out of there fast before the enemy found us. We split up into two groups, Mike and I in one, and the others in another. We agreed to meet at a rendezvous point, where another chopper would pick us up. We ran as fast as we could, dodging bullets and grenades. We reached a cave, where we decided to take cover for a while. We checked our radios, but they were jammed. We had no way of contacting the others. We waited for a few minutes, hoping that the coast was clear. Then we heard a roar, a loud, inhuman roar that made our blood run cold. We looked at each other and grabbed our guns. Something was coming. We saw a shadow moving in the darkness. It was big and fast. It leaped out of the cave and landed in front of us. It was a creature unlike anything we had ever seen. It had the body of a bear, but the head of a wolf. It had claws, fangs, and spikes all over its fur. It had red eyes that glowed with malice. It snarled at us and charged. We opened fire, but it seemed to have no effect. The bullets bounced off its skin as if it was wearing armor. It swiped at Mike and knocked him down. It bit his leg and dragged him into the cave. I screamed and followed them. I fired at the creature, but it ignored me. It reached the end of the cave where there was a metal door. It slammed the door shut and locked it. I heard Mike's muffled cries and the creature's growls. I banged on the door and shouted, Mike, Mike, hang on, buddy, I'm coming for you. I tried to break the door, but it was too strong. I looked around and saw a keypad. It had a code that I didn't know. I tried to guess it, but it was useless. I was running out of time. I gave up and slumped to the floor. I felt tears in my eyes and anger in my heart. I had failed my friend. I had failed my mission. I had failed my country. I don't know how long I stayed there until I heard a helicopter. It was our rescue team. They had found me and took me away. They asked me what happened, but I couldn't tell them. I was in shock. I was in denial. I was in grief. They took me to a hospital where they treated my wounds. They told me that the others had made it out alive, but they couldn't find Mike. They said he was missing in action, presumed dead. They said they would keep looking for him, but I knew they wouldn't. I knew he was gone. They gave me a medal and a discharge. They said I was a hero and a survivor. They said I should be proud and move on. They said they were sorry and left me alone. I didn't feel like a hero. I felt like a failure. I didn't want to move on. I wanted to go back. I didn't want their sympathy. I wanted their answers. What was that creature? Where did it come from? Why did it take Mike? What did it do to him? I needed to know. I needed to find out. I needed to avenge him. I spent the next few years searching for clues. I hacked into military databases and scoured the internet. I contacted former SEAL buddies and shady informants. I followed leads and chased rumors. I learned things that I wished I hadn't. 
I learned that the creature was part of a secret military program called Project Chimera. It was an experiment to create super soldiers by combining human and animal DNA and enhancing them with nanobots. Nanobots that could make them stronger, faster, and more lethal, but also more susceptible to hacking and remote control. I learned that Mike was not the only one who was taken by the creature. There were others who had gone missing in similar circumstances. They were all SEALs who had been on missions in remote areas. They were all captured and turned into chimeras. I learned that the program was run by a rogue general who had a twisted vision of the future. He wanted to create an army of chimeras that he could control with a device called the Master. He wanted to use them to overthrow the government and start a new world order. I learned that he had a base in the same mountain range where I had lost Mike. He had a lab where he performed his experiments. He had a vault where he stored his chimeras. He had a plan to unleash them on the world. I learned that he was about to execute his plan in a few days. He had a target, a small town in Wyoming, where he would test his chimeras. He had a date, New Year's Eve, when he would launch his attack. I learned that I had to stop him. I had to stop him before it was too late. I had to stop him for Mike. I gathered my gear and headed to Wyoming. I contacted some of my old SEAL buddies who agreed to help me. They were loyal and brave. They were the best and the only ones I could trust. We arrived at the town and set up our base. We scouted the area and located the enemy's base. We planned our strategy and prepared our weapons. We waited for the night and prayed for the best. We attacked at midnight when the fireworks started. We used the noise and the chaos to our advantage. We infiltrated the base and fought our way through. We reached the lab and planted the explosives. We reached the vault and opened the door. We saw them. The chimeras. There were dozens of them in cages. They were all different, but all the same. They were all monsters, but all human. They were all enemies, but all friends. We saw Mike. He was in a cage in the corner. He was different from the others. He was bigger and stronger. He was the alpha and the leader. He was the first and the last. He had changed beyond recognition. He looked like half Robocop, half human, with weird brain implants in his head. He snarled at us and broke his cage. He freed the other creatures and led them to us. They attacked us and showed no mercy. We fought back and gave it our all. We fired at them and tried to hit their weak spots. We aimed for the small electric circuit near their heads where their brain implants were. We knew it was the only way to kill them. We killed some of them, but not all of them. They were too many and too fast. In the end, we cleansed the base, but their leader escaped. We call for a backup and Chopper finally arrived. It led us to safety. While on Evac, some government official threatened us if we tell what happened to anyone. So I live in West Virginia and I was walking to a neighbor's house and as I was walking I look up at the mountains which are everywhere around her. And one of the mountains I focused on I seen a white orb looking thing. It was probably 100 feet above the ground. It was probably the size of an average garbage bag. I watched it float through the air for a good minute and I couldn't figure out what it was. Also there was no wind at the time. All right, so just for context, me, my sister, and my mom were coming back from Indio, California from a stay at a hotel because it's pretty barren out there and it's creepy aff in the hotel because it's so quiet. Adding to that, we just didn't want her to be alone at the hotel because things happen. So yesterday night on Thursday, we drove back home. It was like an hour and 40 minutes, maybe 30 minutes. We get home, bring our small amount of luggage in, say hi to my dad and brother, 
relax and just prepare for bed. So skip maybe an hour or two. It was probably 12.30 a.m. or 1 a.m. Me, my brother, and my sister all share one room and we're already in bed. We're just on our phones doing our own thing. We have this little fan that doesn't make much noise, and we had opened the window for fresh air. After maybe 10 minutes or so, my brother says, I'm going to go to the bathroom. I'll be back. He gets up and leaves to do whatever he needs to do. Now it's just me and my sister in the room, and two minutes after my brother leaves, we hear this constant clinking sound. It wasn't inconsistent or anything, but we'd hear a clink, a two-second rest, and then another clink for what seemed to be a good 10 or 15 minute time span. So meanwhile, all this me and my sister wonder what it is. So she tells me to slowly close the window. I do that and we could still hear the clinking. And meanwhile, all of this me and my sister feel a sense of unease and heavy heartedness. My brother comes back, I tell him, and he turns off the fan and we just sit in bed quietly listening while he looks out the shutters. He asks me if we locked the door and I said I'm not sure so he goes downstairs. Chex comes back up and tells me to make sure to lock the top lock. We're sitting here listening and he looks out the window and claims something moved outside. Now keep in mind we leave maybe two or three minutes away from the San Gabriel Mountains so it could have just been a coyote or some kind of animal walking around because coyotes and other animals do often come down from the mountains for whatever reason. We fall asleep and the following morning my brother tells me that he could hear the clinking sound better and it sounded louder downstairs as it was down our driveway. Also this clinking sound sounded like some kind of wood hitting each we don't exactly have any sightings. We just heard something at night that seemed to make us uneasy. Anyone know what this could be? I've been threatened by law enforcement and political leaders in our area for my continued mention of the hairy people. We own a small plot of land in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, Calhoun County, West Virginia. We've got over 60 acres. It's been in my family for generations. I have a story to tell you about my brother and his friend that happened just three years ago. My brother didn't believe me about not crossing into the hairy people's valley. He is ex-military. They decided to hunt and camp right on the line where we don't cross. They camp too close to these monsters. Well, they found out the hard way that these beasts mean business. They woke up at three in the morning hearing their two large pit bull dogs being ripped to pieces. They came home crying for all of us to go with them and wipe out the whole family of these hairy beings. I explained to him that we've seen at least 30 of them going into the caves where they live. I know if we started a war with these hairy people we will lose. They can hide in these miles of caves then come out and come after whoever they want when they want. You will receive no help from the government or the cops. It's just an unwritten law for some reason. I don't know why, but I know it's true. Please share my story. People need to know that they are not only fighting these monsters, but for some reason we are fighting the very people who are supposed to keep us safe. I'm sure I'll be catching hell from our local law enforcement, but I'm beyond giving a damn. I'm ready to speak up and start talking about these dangerous hairy people. I like traveling alone. My RV camper is my home. I just love the look of the open road that's stretched endlessly as I maneuver my RV through the vast landscapes. I'm Sarah, a solo traveler seeking solace in the simplicity of the journey. Hours had passed since I last parked, and the exhaustion finally caught up with me. In need of rest, I decided to settle in a remote location, far from the hustle and bustle of civilization. As the sun dipped below the horizon, I parked my RV near remote wilderness. The quiet solitude was both calming and eerie. I prepared a simple meal, gazing out at the beauty surrounding me. That's when I noticed it a car parked nearby, inconspicuous at first. I shrugged off the initial unease, convincing myself it was another traveler seeking a quiet spot for the night. 
Night fell, and I crawled into my makeshift bed, the coziness of my RV providing a semblance of security. However, as the hours ticked away, an unsettling feeling crept over me. A subtle discomfort settled in my gut, and I couldn't shake the sensation of being watched. I dismissed it as paranoia, a byproduct of fatigue, and attempted to succumb to the embrace of sleep. In the dead of night, a strange noise jolted me awake. It was a sound foreign to the stillness, a whisper on the wind, a creak of metal. My heart pounded as I strained to listen, realizing the noise was just outside my RV. Panic seized me as I cautiously approached the window, peering into the darkness. A shadowy humanoid-like figure lurked, obscured by the night. Fear gripped me as I fumbled to secure the doors and windows, the figure persistently attempting entry. The vulnerability of my solitary existence sank in. I was alone, miles away from any semblance of help, and the eerie feeling of being hunted clawed at my senses. Desperation pushed me to reach for my phone, my lifeline to the outside world. But to my dismay, there was no signal. The isolation intensified, and my heart sank as I realized the gravity of the situation. My only hope was to turn on the RV and get the hell out of there. As I turned on my RV, the figure outside remained a menacing presence, refusing to relent. My attempts to scare it and threaten yield no results. After a few minutes, I went full throttle from that place and never again returned. If you're interested, I'll give you coordinates of the place of encounter. Some of you may remember that back in 2014, a man named Eric Frayne ambushed two Pennsylvania state troopers, killing one before fleeing into the woods, armed and intent to cause trouble, and beginning an almost 50-day manhunt in the wet forests of eastern Pennsylvania. That part of Pennsylvania is beautiful but treacherous land. It's rolling, gentle hills with thickets of scrub and hidden bogs. There are a million swamps to traverse, and some of those hills are secretly just piles of shale waiting to slide out from your feet. The tree cover is dense, and you cannot walk a straight line for 50 feet. Mr. Brain knew this land well, you see, and it's why he dodged a massive manhunt for about six weeks, often teasing the trackers and their dogs. He laid traps, stored weapon caches, and generally relived Rambo. First blood, but with way less fighting. I was working as a wetland scientist scouting out a proposed path for a natural gas pipeline through that land. In the middle of the manhunt, in the very same forest Mr. Brain hid in. So we were in the woods being stopped by search teams, buzzed by helicopters, and, in all likelihood, crossing old trails laid by Mr. Brain himself. When the pipe bomb traps hit the news, I spent every moment scanning the forest floor for tripwires. It was a frightening experience at odds with that land in early autumn. The bushes in the swamp started to turn fiery red while the leaves went orange and yellow. The air is crisp and there's enough green for it to stand out. Everything is covered in a light mist in the morning that burns off by lunchtime, and the sun is clear and warm. There is nothing so off-putting as standing in radiant beauty believing you are in absolute peril. When I was in my early 20s, my friends and I thought it would be a brilliant idea to go night hiking through some woods said to be haunted. It was a very, very, very old town that died out due to some illness. I believe the rumors said tuberculosis. You can walk the horse path and there are stone foundations on either side of you. Really neat, actually. You were supposed to be able to hear children laughing and dancing in the trees, apparently. Yeah, didn't hear any children laughing, but I did record our whole hike. That night, going over the footage with a friend of mine on his TV, he told me to stop and rewind. I did, and we must have rewound that thing 30 times. There was a face peeking behind trees following us. Not a human face, a weird, gremlin-type face, distorted. Large sunken eyes and a flat nose, pointy chin. 
We thought we were seeing things, but we watched it so many times, adjusted the brightness and contrast on his TV. Sure as shit. Never went back. While on our honeymoon in June of 1985, my wife and I were backpacking overnight in the Mount Jefferson Wilderness area. We were camped about three miles from the trailhead. I think it was called the Whitewater Trailhead. We were camped just off the trail at around 5 e 300 feet, and there were no other campers around for miles. Sometime during the middle of the night, we were both awakened by very heavy footsteps coming down the trail. I was an experienced backpacker and had encountered deer, elk, and bear before including having my camp raided by a black bear in the Adirondack Mountains. This creature was definitely bipedal. It took two steps, stopped, took two more steps, stopped, etc. With each set of steps, the creature was clearly much closer to our camp. After the third or fourth set of steps, I let out the loudest scream I could muster. The creature immediately leapt, took two steps away from camp, and was gone. Its actions gave the impression that it was attempting to be stealthy and investigate our camp. After a few minutes we left the tent, we did not actually see the creature because the tent flap was zipped closed, built up the fire, and made lots of noise. Once there was sufficient light after several long hours, we examined the trail for footprints. The footsteps appeared to be coming from the trail, but as conditions had been dry, we found no prints. There were also no other signs of the creature around the area. As an experiment, my wife went into the tent, laid down, and I stomped down the trail as loudly as possible in my lug boots. I am six foot three and weighed around 220 at that time. She heard my stomping, but it was nothing compared to the night before where we could actually feel the ground shake. Also, despite my best efforts, I was unable to leave any prints on the trail. After thoroughly extinguishing the fire, we packed up and went back to our car. We did not report the incident to the Marion County Sheriff. While working as a park ranger, I had an experience with the supernatural. It was a scary ordeal, I must confess. A group of hikers had gotten lost in the woods, and my fellow rangers and I had decided to scout out the area. We got the general direction from the report that was made by their own families. Heading off in the direction, we drove until we got to the entrance of the woods, where they at last made contact with their families, according to the report. We parked the car just outside the woods and proceeded to search for them. We had searched for a better part of the day without anything to show for it. It was late in the evening already, and we had walked deep into the woods. I was feeling uneasy with every step we took. It was as if there was a terrifying monster hidden within the woods. A sense of terror suddenly engulfed me, making me break out in cold sweat. I glanced at my colleague, who seemed to have sensed nothing as his expression was as usual. I could not put my finger on it, but something eerie was happening in the woods. Suddenly, we began seeing strange markings, words written in an unknown language, different depictions on trees. What was strange was the fact that my colleague, for some reason, was unaware of everything. It was like he was in another dimension, detached from his surroundings. It was in that moment that it hit me, a dimension. Had he mistakenly stepped into a dimensional portal? Was that how the hikers had gotten lost? Had they stepped into it as well? If they had, that would explain the disappearance and why we were unable to find traces of them. It was, of course, a mind-blowing theory, so I wanted to test it out. I moved closer to my colleague, attempted to touch him, but my hands went right through him like he did not exist. I could see him, but couldn't touch him. I called out his name, hoping to get his attention and alert him to the danger we were in. I called out his name several more times, even radioed him, Yet he continued walking deeper into the woods like a puppet on its string, being pulled. After my futile attempts, I proceeded to search for the missing party on my own. I came across so many skeletons and bones piled up into a small mountain. At this point, the terror in my heart had reached its peak. 
I resisted the urge to scream. I beat a hasty retreat and stepped on numerous bones in the process. What scared me was that the bones did not let out the usual crunch sound after being stepped on. Rather, they simply crumbled into dust. I could not help but wonder how long these bones had been buried there. This took my mind to the missing hikers. Were they already bones, or were they alive like me? Terrified and hopeless, I was at my wit's end already, and I could not help but feel despair. I glanced at my wristwatch to check the time, but what I saw shocked me. Time moves faster here. I had barely spent two hours in the woods, yet my wristwatch was displaying a date that was two days ahead. Two hours equal two days here. At this rate, my lifespan would run out before whatever was lurking around would kill me. At this point, all I had in my mind was how to escape this hell hole that I had somehow gotten myself into. All thoughts of searching and rescuing the lost hikers did not cross my mind. At this point, all I could think of was how to get out of my situation. My mind was in chaos, disoriented, and I could not think straight. Just when I thought things could not get any worse, I began hearing voices, and the feeling of being stalked overwhelmed me. I could feel something or someone watching me, and the thought of that made me panic. There was nothing scarier than the unknown, especially in a place such as this. I kept on walking, and my nerves were taut and on edge, ready to react to any situation. I moved on without a sense of direction, hoping to luckily find an exit or something. Glancing at my wristwatch, I saw to my utter dismay that I had spent close to a week now trapped in this place. While I was aware that time was moving faster, things would be different as long as I found an exit. It did nothing to comfort me. I had no idea when I would find an exit out of this dimension. By the time I had spent a couple of months, I threw a stroke of luck. I was able to find a way out. The moment I stepped out, my walkie-talkie buzzed incessantly. People had been trying to reach me and even my colleague. I radioed my colleague, but got no reply. I knew he was still trapped in there, and there was no hope for him to get out. He was not even aware. My story caused a sensation, and I was rushed to the hospital for tests and examinations. The doctor confirmed that my cells had gone through rapid aging. My cells had grown older than they should have. I would have to be placed on a special diet to prolong my lifespan. A few weeks later, the missing hikers were found. However, all of them had lost their youthful appearance, which further boosted the authenticity of my story. Despite getting intensive medical care, all hikers died mysteriously afterwards. My colleague disappeared, and I was told to keep quiet. The entire case was shut down before the press could even get out and no public knowledge ever became aware. I spent about six months last year essentially volunteering on organic farms in exchange for room and board. One of the farms I stayed at was actually an off-the-grid homestead near Mount Hood, Oregon, populated by shamanic hippies who had some wild stories themselves. And while not remote, was deep enough in the mountains that we had no neighbors for at least 10 miles in every direction. Beautiful forested land with an amazing view of Mount Hood from the garden. I was camping every night for about two weeks before weird things started happening. The first bizarre occurrence happened not to me, but to a fellow friend who I'll call Jay. Now, I am not particularly outdoorsy. I grew up in the woods in North Florida and spent my formative years getting lost in places I shouldn't be, but I don't have a great deal of camping experience and only the most basic survival skills. I am comfortable in the woods, but only until sunset. Jay, a true outdoorsman, had been a forest ranger in the Alaskan bush for two years prior and frequently went on weeks-long solo backpacking trips. He had shown up at the farm a few days after me and had set up camp over a mile further down the mountain than I had, which I initially thought was a dickish move but later came to appreciate because he played his harmonica at all hours and nobody needs to hear that shit. He was a slow-talking Minnesotan that favored all things logical. One morning, we met up for breakfast and he asked me if I had heard all that screaming the night before. I hadn't. He told me that he had been laying in his tent with his headlamp on, 
reading a book when he heard a deep, rumbling scream just outside his tent. He turned his lamp off to listen more closely and realized that his entire tent was illuminated from the outside, as if someone was aiming a floodlight at it. In the few seconds after he turned his headlamp off, two things happened in rapid succession. The screaming cut off as if someone had flipped a switch, and the light from outside clicked off. He listened for footsteps, but heard nothing. After a few moments of silence, he turned his headlamp back on and left his tent to investigate, because I guess he had never seen a horror movie in his whole Gotham life. He said that there was nothing in the clearing and no movement from the surrounding forest, even though he hadn't heard anything leave. And the scream had been very close to, if not within, his camp. Then he apparently shrugged to himself and went to sleep. Or maybe he passed out in fear and was too much of a man to admit it. He told me this over breakfast and I was horrified. He said he'd never heard an animal that sounded like that and could not explain the light, except that maybe a hunter had found their way onto our land. But then where did they go? He listened for footsteps and heard nothing. He didn't seem worried, just a bit perturbed. It was very Minnesota of him. Everything was quiet for a few weeks after that incident. Jay left for another farm and I remained in my old campsite only about three quarters of a mile down from the main cabin. I was comfortable in my tent and no longer jerked awake at broken twigs or animals moving through the brush. I was very proud of myself, look at me, an outdoors woman. Which was, of course, when the screaming started. I was laying in my tent, just on the edge of sleep when it started. It was a deep, low roaring. Unlike any animal I knew to live in the mountains in that region. I consoled myself by saying it was an injured black bear, a messed up wolf, some kind of Lovecraftian mutant elk. Then from farther down the mountain, something else began screaming answering. The two whatever shrieked at each other for the better part of an hour. I laid in my tent, trying to psych myself up to hike back up to the main cabin, but couldn't quite commit. I laced up my boots and put on my headlamp in case I had to make a run for it. Eventually, the screaming stopped and I somehow managed to sleep. I woke up somewhere around 4 a.m. to something very large shuffling in the bush directly behind my tent. I laid in the dark and listened, absolutely terrified. Elk bear, it was too large. I could hear it ruffling branches of trees at least six feet off the ground. I heard it take a step and then another. Bipedal. Human. Hunter. The hunter would never be as loud as this thing was, and I seriously doubt they would disturb an obvious campsite. Besides, in the month I'd been on the homestead at that point, I'd never heard a gunshot. I'd never seen anyone other than the people I was working with this far up the mountain, for that matter. I laid there, considering my options. It moved slowly, like it was picking through the bushes behind me. Which, in retrospect, of course it was, I'd camped right next to Wild Blackberry. I laid and listened and waited for a long time, almost until sunrise. It was moving slowly down the mountain. I laid in my tent long after the noise died out. When I finally managed to rally my nerves and leave my tent, the brush behind my tent was obviously disturbed. I thought about investigating, looking for prints, droppings, but decided I'd rather just repress the whole thing and deal with it when I was far, far away from these woods. At breakfast, I asked my host, Anne, about the screaming. She was delighted that I'd had a run-in with the forest people. She said that years ago when they'd moved onto the land, the forest people would get into their garden and make a mess of things, so she'd started leaving baskets of produce for them as a sign of goodwill. They'd left the garden alone since. Then I camped out for another week before it got too cold, and I moved into the main cabin, and never heard anything weird again. Pretty anticlimactic, but I guess real life usually is. Still very bizarre and interesting. As a lifelong student of all things esoteric, it verified a lot of suspicions I had. Mostly that weird shit happens in the woods. It's also pretty telling that everyone I met in the Cascades. Granted, most of them were of the shamanic, metaphysical persuasion had a Sasquatch story. There were a few other strange things about that place. But this story is by far the most interesting. Oregon is a weird, wonderful place.
I'm a police officer, so I had just finished my shift and was on my current way home. I had stopped off at Wendy's to grab a quick bite to eat. It was right around midnight, so the drive through was pretty dead. As I went through the line, I saw this thing just standing there, watching me from across the parking lot. Not sure what it was, but it looked really tall and skinny, with gangly arms and legs hanging out. It gave me this very uneasy feeling, and I watched it as it turned and walked away over to some shrubbery behind one of those big light poles by the parking lot exit and entrance. I try not to think too much of it and just drove away. There's just something about what I saw that still really spooked me. I feel very unsettled in my stomach just thinking back to it. As I was getting home from work, I was still shaken up. I could not stop thinking about what I saw, so I decided to show my son and daughter 8 and 10, who were getting ready for bed, about what had rattled me so badly. Not that I could actually show them, but at least tell them. My kids kind of just looked at me like I was crazy, but being kids, I found they would believe me a lot more than my wife would. Then they started telling me about Slenderman, which sounds like it might be what I saw. But I don't know any of these creepypasta characters kids watch nowadays. Could you kindly give me any information on what do you think I saw, and was this paranormal or not? I suppose it is expected that anybody who chooses to follow in the footsteps of smoking the bear would be possibly stuck in a few scary situations. That certainly was the case for me as I spent my nights working alongside park rangers on some of the most dangerous and terrifying trails in the States. It's not what one might think about being a ranger, though. We don't spend every day sitting around watching deer graves or children play in the playgrounds. Instead, what happens behind those locked gates is something more akin to horror movies than a picnic. If you manage to find your way through these wooded corridors without being eaten alive by some wild animal or eaten after by a bear, you could end up with some serious psychological damage. As my first summer as a ranger was coming to an end, I decided that I wanted to spend one last night in the woods alone. Not many rangers do that kind of thing anymore. But for me, it was sort of this cleansing ritual. My girlfriend had just broken up with me at the time, and I needed time to work through that emotional trauma. I knew there were other people who understood my pain. They would be likely willing to talk about the world ending when we got close enough in proximity. But every man needs his space from time to time, even if he is working within the confines of the law. To be honest, I wasn't really sure where to expect to be out there in the woods with no one else around. I had been alone quite a few times before, but never running into any real trouble. But this time, my mind was racing through the worst case scenarios, and it almost felt like fate that I would get caught up in some kind of adventure by myself. Either I was going to find somebody who could relate to all my situations, or perhaps even fall for them as they helped me do it all. Anyway, I made it to the trailhead, and then Julian began hiking down towards it to my favorite spot at Lake Oroville State Park. The entire park is beautiful, located not far from Sacramento, but until you are actually standing deep within its borders, you can't truly grasp its beauty. I loved watching the weather rolling over the water, feeling the cold air as it rushed past my face and into my lungs, waking me up from a lazy afternoon nap. I felt at peace with myself every time I visited this spot, but not so much that other people bothered me. That's why this was almost certainly going to be a good night. I just crossed over one of the small bridges leading across the lake when I heard something rustling behind me, more similar to low growls than anything else, really. It sounded like something was stalking towards me, perhaps a bear. The only thing about these sounds that didn't scream bear were its frequency. They were more sporadic than I would have expected. My ears picked up this distinct sound of footsteps more than once, actually, as if somebody were running towards me directly through the thicket. Not wanting to meet with whatever was out there on my own terms, I scrambled for one of the trees and threw myself up into it to try and hide. Unfortunately, jumping back had cost me more time than I realized, and by the time that I reached around and grabbed hold of a branch, something hit me hard right in the side. 
You know, it feels like forever before I felt like landing against something soft and squishy. It wasn't exactly warm or inviting, so all of those other feelings must just be an illusion brought on by adrenaline. It only took a single moment for me to realize what had been happening, that I had been wrapped at the ankles, waist, shoulders, and neck in some kind of netting. I didn't know what exactly it was made out of, but it wasn't rope. It was some sort of binding material. My hands were then completely immobilized by entanglement as well, so there wasn't much I could do other than struggle against my bonds, a dead-end endeavor if there ever was one. Now, the first thing I noticed when I could finally see again is it was completely dark around me. All light coming from behind with only blackness ahead. Two dim lights appeared along the walls on either side of me and began approaching slowly. As my eyes now adjust, they were really more like natural animal eyes than any sort of man-made illusions. Even worse, I noticed that the blackness ahead of me wasn't really coming from a lack of light at all. Instead, there appeared to be some kind of organic wall blocking up my view, spreading out across the room to each side. I had no idea how large this place was, but it must have been bigger than what I could see. One behind me and another in front of me, they made themselves known. Moments later, footsteps. The noises were too far away for me to make out at first, but then I could hear they belonged to something, and more than two. Now, at this point, fear began gripping my heart as I lashed out against my binds once again, only to find that they hadn't been loosened in the slightest. More so, I thought, we'll get to that in a moment. I was hauled from my small prison by several sets of long, clawed hands that dragged over what appeared to be some kind of altar. It was much different from one of those sacrificial altars appearing to be used in ancient times for rituals. The ones to appease unworldly beings were said to lurk within the space between two worlds. But this one seemed more like a place where people got together for satanic worship or other unholy activities. These beings holding me lured me down onto it and began weaving this sort of flower all around me while chanting something in this ungodly language. I was so terrified, I swear I could have had a heart attack. I could make out all the words, but I had no idea what this thing was or what they were saying. The entire group of these things began chanting in unison as they surrounded me, continued weaving more of this plant material around me. It felt like forever before they finally got to the last one. All I could do was just lay there on my back, completely immobilized by flowers, while these creatures circled around me once and turned their backs towards me. The chance stopped abruptly, and every creature but one turned to leave. The remaining one tossed this mask aside, revealing a set of devilish features underneath it. What I had been dealing with looked like a combination of wild, feral human beings and kind of goblinish people. You know what, it kind of reminded me of the trolls or orcs in Lord of the Rings. Humanoid, terrifying looking, but also not human. That's what they reminded me of. It stood there, shaking its head from side to side slowly with its arms raised upward as I tried to break free. Again, I cannot reiterate how terrifying this was. I had no idea what was going to happen, and I was convinced in that moment I was about to be sacrificed by some sort of underground dwelling creatures. I was so scared beyond belief. Then, this thing pulled its arm down after shaking its head and walked away. Completely immobilized, I tried my best to get out of my entrapment, and I believe it was the massive amounts of adrenaline exploding through my entire being that allowed me to break free. As I did, though, I could hear these things coming back, and I knew I had to escape as quickly as I could. Once fully free, I started to run for it, escaping in just a matter of time, feeling my way out of this black, organic labyrinth. I don't know if I was in a cave or what this was, but as I reflect back on these memories, I had so much flooding through my mind. I feel like I kind of blacked out. I don't really know if I remember much after that, but I do distinctly remember collapsing on the ground and being found later on. I know that's probably very anticlimactic, but when the human body endures that kind of traumatic stress, it does things to the brain that aren't exactly normal. Anyway, I was treated at the hospital, ultimately taken back to the station and sent home. I didn't actually believe what I experienced at first. 
I thought it was some crude nightmare or horrible hallucination. But it wasn't until later that I realized it must have been something that really happened, because I actually had binding marks around my ankles, my thighs, my waist, and my wrists. Those bindings were on tight, and I must have wiggled free enough that I loosened them. Like I said, whatever the bindings were made of, they were this crude rope vine material. I've never seen it before in my life. None of them really believed me, though, when I actually got a chance to describe what happened. They thought I was either making it up or just had a bad nightmare. As you can probably bet, this incident has been difficult for me. At any rate, this is my story, and I hope you can get enjoyment from a real-life traumatic event. I don't care if you believe me, and if you choose to read this, which, by the way, you have permission to, I don't care if your readers believe me. I know there's something out there that lives underneath the ground, something that isn't quite human. God, I really want to tell this to people. So a few months ago, my girlfriend and I went to a public state park. It is not like a middle of nowhere, but still not many people around, and it was in the afternoon that a strange thing happened. When we were heading out of the park, we saw a car that was traveling on the opposite side toward us. Then the car turned right, it was a sedan. We thought there was a road right there. And when we got to the section where that car turned, we didn't see any road but only high grass and big trees. I asked my girlfriend, did you see that red car just now? I thought it turned right around here. She said, I saw a car too, but it was white, wasn't it? We look at each other's for a few seconds and quickly left that area. That was weird. Visiting a friend in California. My last night there and we're talking about how I hadn't seen any redwoods. So we hop in the car at 11 o'clock at night and head off to some forest trail that he knows. We get there and there is a gate with a sign on it which we don't read. He's carrying his toy poodle. We walk a little ways but the trees aren't that big. He says they get bigger further in and sparks up a joint and we keep walking. Maybe a half mile and we hear the loudest scream I have ever heard. We stop and looked at each other and my friend says, I think someone just got murdered. We stood there for a few minutes to see if we heard anything else, and then we heard it again. It seemed to be closer, but it was tough to tell as it was echoing. Still no clue what it is, but we decide we should probably get out of there. Didn't really think much of it afterwards until I read an article about a mountain lion stalking someone, and there was audio of the sound mountain lions make. I send the link to my friend saying I think we are lucky to be alive. He laughs and says, You know I was up that way recently and noticed that the sign on the gate is a warning for mountain lions in the area. I was fishing in this little pond in the woods near my buddy's house. I heard a growling from across the water, but it was a really deep growl. I look up and I saw what can only be described as a Sasquatch. It was looking right at me from across the lake, which is about 100 feet away. Then it dropped on its belly and, I want to say, crawled away because that was the motion. But it was super fast. Reminded me of a liquor from Resident Evil. I literally peed my pants and whimpered a little and was in shock for a moment. I never told a soul because who would believe me? This happened to my grandfather years ago. I guess he was out hunting and walking around in some woods, maybe five miles from a main road near where my family settled north of Pittsburgh. He said that he started seeing these burnt out candles and started picking them up for some reason. He followed them for like a 100 yards, and at the very end, there was a circle of black candles with a hole in the ground that looked to be a grave. He brought all the candles home and my grandma yelled at him, and made him throw them away. I was canoeing into my hunting area a few years back. Came around a bend and saw some teenagers, maybe 20-year-olds walking down the train tracks. I waved hello and they proceeded to shoot a couple bullets in the river 40 yards in front and behind my boat. I have never been so angry in my whole life. 
I thought about going ashore downstream and sneaking up behind them to let a few bullets rip myself, but was afraid I might accidentally kill someone. This happened about two years ago on October 27th. I do a lot of hiking and I wanted to share with you all what is without a doubt one of the strangest things that I have experienced while hiking. While on the way back from the summit of Mount San Jacinto in California, a fairly popular trail, just as day was changing over to dusk about four miles and 20 vertical feet, a good two, three hour hike from the tram, we spotted a woman dressed in all black flapper attire with the exception of a white scarf. This woman was in dress shoes and carrying a very nice beaded purse. She was walking very intently and at a hurried pace up the mountain. If you're familiar with the hike, it's at the top of the Wellman Divide. Nearly without words, I asked her if she was lost, to which she replied. I'm on the trail, errant I. Her face looked gray and her lips were sort of blue. It was pretty cold outside. So as quickly as she had passed us, she was gone. My friend and myself looked at each other like, now we have seen everything. After conversations with other hikers on the way down that had also seen her, I was kiddingly remarking that I was sure we had seen some sort of ghost. Looking for a lost love much like the mysterious lady in black story folklore. It was a truly bizarre experience. About an hour later we were resting at Round Valley and we saw her again. Keep in mind, this is literally in the middle of the forest at 9,000 feet elevation. A good two hours hike from anything and the temps were around 35 degrees. The fact that it's so close to Halloween was not lost on me either. At any rate, I make no claims of the supernatural, but I'm not ruling it out. But I thought everyone might enjoy the story and the pictures of this truly strange encounter. I worked offshore for five years as an ROV pilot, the robots that go underwater. I have seen some odd things. Worked on a job where the field we were working on has barrels at bottom of ocean. We were told we couldn't go near these with a robot. Apparently these were dumped by the US government during Cold War era. Who knows what was in those barrels? I've seen all kinds of rare creatures, including exclusive six gill sharks. One of the cooler things I saw was an eel eating another eel the exact same size. Imagine a snake underwater eating another snake exact same size. That was pretty cool because it looked like the eel detached its jaw like a snake and everything. Also has seen giant bluefin tuna. Tuna in general can be anywhere from surface to a couple thousand feet down. The ability to dive like that still amazes me. I worked in the oil spill in the Gulf. To see oil just pour out like that is something we have all seen, but to be there and realize that's just below you a mile below is something else. For me, it was crazy to see that many robots underwater at same time as you have usually max four two vessels, but rarely. It was chaotic as heck. The vessels out there were so close we could almost just have conversations with people by shouting, which is very rare. One of the crazy things I won't forget is two vessels were flaring off, literally just burning off oil, and I could feel the heat from their vessel on the one I was. I have whole stories I could talk about that really, but to be part of something that was that huge, even though it wasn't a good thing in our history, I can still say I was part of it and be proud to stop the spill. In January 1965, a group of musicians, including Jimi Hendrix driving back to Manhattan, were stranded in a blizzard and had gotten stuck in a heavy drift that reached the hood of their vehicle. It was bitter cold. Unexpectedly, the road ahead of them suddenly lit up as a bright phosphorescent object, cone-shaped like a capsule, landed in the snow about 100 feet up ahead. It stood on a tripod landing gear. Before any of the stunned occupants of the vehicle could move, a door opened on the side of the craft and an entity stepped out. He stood eight feet tall, his skin was yellowish, and instead of eyes, the creature had slits. His forehead came to a point and his head ran straight to his chest, leaving the impression that he had no neck. The being proceeded to float to the ground and glided towards the trapped occupants of the van. The snow melted in the wake of the creature. 
His body seemed to generate tremendous heat, so much so that as it came across a small rise, the snow disappeared around in all directions. In a matter of what seemed like seconds, the being came over to the right-hand side of the van, where Hendricks sat, and looked right through the window. According to other witnesses at the scene, the creature seemed to be communicating telepathically with Hendricks. Immediately, the interior of their vehicle began to heat up. The heat coming from the being evaporated the snow enough to free their imprisoned van. The being glided behind the van and the snowdrift by now had completely vanished. Turning the ignition, the driver gunned the engine and drove away at high speed. As they looked back, they could see the road filling in with snow again. The object was at the same instant lifting off like a rocket from a launching pad. When a freak storm lashed the Gulf of Lyon and the inland villages were battered by winds of ferocious force, I was awakened by an insistent tapping on the window of my downstairs bedroom. At first, I dismissed it as the wind wrapping a twig onto the glass, but finally I got up and went to the door with a lantern. A strange sight met my eyes. In the doorway stood a boy, aged about ten, wrapped in a piece of sacking. His hair was long and yellow, quite unlike that of the local boys, and his face almost luminously pale. He appeared to have no clothes apart from the sack, and as he stretched out his arms towards the light, I noticed that there were only three fingers on each of his long, slender hands. I stood there uncertain of what to do until my wife's voice roused me into action. She had come from the bedroom, taken one look at the strange tableau, and told me to bring the child into the house. She roused the fire in the kitchen, placed the shivering boy before it, and covered him with a blanket. He slept the night on a mattress in front of the fire. In the morning, my wife and I found him some clothes belonging to our oldest son, but it was soon apparent that he didn't know how to put them on. At first, I took him for some dumb waif, a simpleton, but it soon became apparent that he could speak, albeit in a language we had never heard before. Even the most commonplace things appeared to astonish him. He was bewildered by a cup containing warm milk and had to be shown how to drink from it. A knife and fork were complete mysteries to him. When a farm cat strolled through the door, the boy backed away, apparently in fright. My wife and I, totally bemused by our uninvited guest, told the story to the village priest, Father René Mouville, a retired Lyons University professor who had entered the priesthood at the age of 50. Once Father Mouville met the boy, he knew there was no obvious solution. The child was quite unlike any human he had seen before. Even the construction of his body seemed exceptional. His hips were extremely narrow, and his rib cage almost an inverted V-shape, quite the opposite of a normal chest structure. Just looking at those delicate, three-fingered hands made the priest feel a strange sense of foreboding. The next day, he took the child back to his house to be cared for by his housekeeper. He soon found that the boy had a fantastic intelligence. Unable to communicate by any form of language, Father Mouville began by drawing simple diagrams of everyday objects, which received no response. Then one day, he wrote down a series of numbers in the form of clustered dots. Immediately, the boy took the paper and pencil and began writing dots at high speed. When he passed back the paper, Father Mouville found that he had worked out the cube root and square roots of all the groups of numbers. As the weeks passed, my confidence grew. I began to master simple words and to go out with Father Mouville on his rounds. I began to be accepted in the village as almost ordinary instead of a curiosity. Basic physical phenomena fascinated me. I would sit for hours by moving water or watching birds in flight and the movement of clouds. It was as though I had never seen such things before. Then, after Christmas 19, I became ill. At first, the symptoms seemed to be those of a heavy cold and after a few weeks I seemed to have recovered. But by February I was sick again, this time with a high fever and a deathly pallor. A doctor was sent for and confessed himself mystified. My heart was the slowest he had ever heard, almost half the speed of a normal human. I should be taken to a hospital, but in my condition, such a journey could well have been fatal. So the boy who came from nowhere became weaker, 
and on the second week of March, I died and was buried under an ash tree in the graveyard of St. Mayand. I am from Waterville, Maine. Back in the late summer, early fall of 1971, I was newly married and living in Killeen, Texas with my husband who was in the army. We had a small duplex apartment in Killeen. One night he had duty and I was home alone in bed around 3 a.m. in the morning. I woke up suddenly and saw a black figure standing at the bottom of my bed. It was eight or nine feet tall and had huge big black wings and red eyes. I closed my eyes and opened them again, and it had moved closer to me on the right side of my bed. I couldn't scream. It was as if I was frozen in fear. I covered my head in the blankets. I was so afraid. About five minutes. Later I looked, and it was gone. It gave me a horrible feeling, and I prayed never to see it again. Shortly after this event, I came back to Maine as I was way too frightened to ever stay alone at night when he had duty. I told my mom I had seen a huge black angel that night, and she was glad I came home as that didn't sound good. I had never heard of the Mothman, but a few years later I came across an article and a drawing of one. Even before I read the article I said, wow, that is exactly what I saw in Texas. It didn't have a noticeable neck and its face was like hooded, its wings tucked in on its side, but you could tell they were very large. It was totally black except for the eyes were round, large, and red. I still think of this thing with fear. Personally, do you have any idea what it is? I'm 57 now and I am still searching for an answer. P.S. The apartment I lived in had a well in the entranceway that always gave me the creeps. A cistern, I believe it is called. Just a flat rock covered it and it still had water in it. I couldn't see the water but I heard the plop when I dropped a rock in it. This probably has nothing to do with any of this, but felt I should tell you anyways. My cousin did a lot of forest surveying in some pretty remote areas in British Columbia, Canada. He and a colleague were driving down an old logging road when a wit van passed them going the opposite direction. He said it was odd to see someone way out there but not unheard of as hunters do use these roads. They went a few more miles down the road, got out and started doing some work and ended up finding a dead body with no head or hands, freshly dumped as it wasn't decayed. They had to go back the same direction as the van. Luckily, they never crossed paths. They reported it to the RCMP and was told it was most likely biker gang related hit. I live a lot of my life in seclusion, though I spend a lot of time in the city as well. I tend to take the creepiest things with me to my home, and I've amassed a great collection of skulls and bones and various other items of morbidity. A few things I've experienced that might be of interest. Deep in the woods, I find a hole dug about three feet down. Around it, someone had constructed a rudimentary tippy out of shipping pallets, reinforced with greased rope and branches. A tarp was tangled over it, blown up by the wind. I peered in and found it recently lived in, freshly stirred dirt at the bottom. I lit the floor of the place with a flashlight and found a collection of undergarments belonging to young girls, all bright colors and cartoon characters, buried beneath a scree of dirt, rocks, and leaves. A duffel bag of loot was tucked in the back, mostly vitamin packets and detritus. Empty liquor bottles. A man's bottoming out point, miles from civilization. The other place was near the grain silos, repurposed by the Salvation Army as an apartment complex for vagrants and mental patients. There was an old oil company, long abandoned and hollowed out, just over a set of train tracks and through a thicket of shrub grass. It was midnight or later and I was alone. Being closer to civilization, I did not want to attract attention. I made my way in the dark Starlight and moonlight offered me a little guidance, though I was mostly beneath an overpass. I heard a rustling in the distance. I was too far in city for this to be a deer, and it sounded bigger than a turkey, which can be found basically anywhere. I had my knife out, and I stepped closer to the origin of the sounds. I heard a groaning, a muttering, gurgling sound. 
a growling. It was growing louder, and I was starting to make out syllables. Not speech per se, not words, but differentiated syllables. Just as the growling reached its zenith, I looked up and saw a man on a bike, pedaling down the sidewalk on the overpass above me. He had headphones on, and he was listening to death metal and growling along with the vocals. I was overcome with relief, but also awash with dread, because now I know why people don't talk to me when I'm on campus, because I do that exact same thing. I've also found some really strange signs out in the middle of nowhere. From memory, I can say that my two favorites are Uncle Bart Will F You Up and Outside an Old Slaughterhouse in Block Printed Scrawl. Cattle Operation Trailer Closed. Please do not dump. You will be seen. I'm sure I can think of more if anyone is interested. I'm a weird dude. I've lived in Lake Charles, born and raised, but in 2004, I moved to Alaska to be a youth pastor for a church. I was living in Seward and was invited to come and speak at a church in Fairbanks. About a nine hour drive. I'm from the South, not used to. I got there in January, this was in February. I took out on this trip by myself and had been given tips. This is where you want to stop. This is where you don't want to stop. Gas is real expensive here. Things like that. So I got out just north of Anchorage. North of Wasilla, up in that part of the country. There are people who have said that you stop and pick up hitchhikers. It's just kind of a thing. You don't really do it in Louisiana. Here it's life and death. If you see somebody on the road, you stop. So I saw a man walking north on the road and I pulled over. He got in the truck and I remember, just remember distinctly, he had a bit of a body odor smell. He smelled like a campfire. He was unshaven. His name, he told me, was Alex. He spoke with a Russian accent and he said he was a mountain climber and he said his favorite place on earth was the top of Mount Everest and that he was in Alaska to climb Mount McKinley. So he was on his way to Denali Park. He rode with me in the car for about two and a half hours, asking me about why I was there, about my calling and feel on my life, those types of things with me. He gave me tips about driving on the ice, told me not to do things that would have caused error. We came to a town called Trapper Creek. I don't know if you are familiar with it. I was not going to get gas there. It was one of the places I was told not to get gas there because the prices will kill you there. He said, you'll want to stop here because the weather is too bad. Denali is going to be closed, and so I said, okay. He had been in the car for two and a half hours. We talked extensively about Everest and his plan to see the top of Mount McKinley. Well, we stopped. I got out, started fueling the car. He grabbed his small backpack that he had and walked into. I saw him walk into the gas station, the little junction station, had a little cafe in it. He walked through the doors. When I finished filling up, I went in to use the restroom, pay and grab a bite. I asked the clerk, I said, where's the man that just walked in? And she looked at me and said, you're the only one that has been here for hours. I said, no, a man just walked through these doors. We spent 20 minutes walking around the back of the building. We followed the tracks, the two sets of tracks back to the truck. He was nowhere to be found. There was icy wetness where he had been sitting in the truck. The truck still smelled like him, so at that point, I've chalked it up to, was it a ghost or was it an angel? I don't know what. I wouldn't have had enough gas. And when I got to Denali, that gas station was indeed closed. Me and my grandpa were walking a deer trail along a five-foot-wide thicket with clear cuts on both sides. It was a peaceful day, with the sun shining through the trees and the sound of birds chirping in the distance. Little did we know that this walk would take a turn towards the mysterious and unknown. As we walked, engrossed in our conversation about hunting and the great outdoors, it was my grandfather who first noticed something strange. He abruptly stopped and muttered, what the bleep is that? His tone made me stop in my tracks and look in the direction he was pointing. There in the soft soil near the trail was the biggest footprint I had ever seen. 
It was deep and wide, easily twice the size of my own foot. The imprint resembled that of a giant creature, and I couldn't help but feel a shiver run down my spine. The kicker to all this was that it was my grandpa's last year of hunting. Due to a cataract in one eye, his doctor advised him to give up hunting. It was a bittersweet moment for him, as he had been an avid hunter his whole life. And now, in his final year, he stumbled upon something truly mysterious. Curiosity peaked. I began searching for any other signs that could lead us to the creature responsible for that enormous footprint. We scanned the surrounding area, looking for tracks, broken branches, or any other evidence of its presence. But to our dismay, we couldn't find anything else. Despite the lack of additional signs, the sighting had spooked me enough to shift my focus from searching for deer to searching for what made that track. I used to live in Spain because my father was a government official. We lived near an area that was frequented by pilgrims. I saw a few dead bodies while I was there. A lot of the pilgrims are really old, and they can't handle the physical toll the, the hike takes, so they suddenly drop dead, or they rest on the side of the road and they never wake up again. I once had the displeasure of seeing one of the corpses up close. The face on the dead woman was contorted. She looked terrified like death had taken her by surprise. As for supernatural, I remember in 2013 I got up early, and I traveled to a path that was frequented by pilgrims. I wanted to go stargazing, and there was relatively little light pollution out in the countryside. When I arrived at my usual spot, I noticed there was a man in brown robes not too far off in the distance. When I yelled a greeting towards him, he turned his face towards me. He was unnaturally pale as if he were a corpse or gravely ill. His eyes were bloodshot and he looked like he was crying. He said not a word to me and turned around again, continuing to stare off into the distance. I remained for a few minutes, but shivers kept running through my spine, and I decided I shouldn't be there so I left. Later that evening, a train derailed at Santiago de Compostela, which is the end point of the pilgrimage and 80 people died. I think this is all a coincidence, and I probably met some sleepy pilgrim. But I told my grandma, and she said it was the spirit of St. James the Muslim killer, as the pilgrim's path is dedicated to him. She says he was trying to warn me of the tragedy that was going to take place later that day. When I was younger, my dad and I went deep sea fishing all the time. The creepiest thing that ever happened to me was when we decided to do a little more surface fishing further out on the open ocean, rather than fish for grouper and whatnot. So I'm sitting with my feet off the edge of the boat, and my dad hooks a fish. It seems pretty big, based on the way it was pulling, so I look over to see if he needs help. Then something slowly brushes my legs. I look down and there was a 4-5 or five jeet barracuda brushing against my legs. I froze and seconds later it shot off. When my dad felt the line go slack, he started reeling in faster. The barracuda had bitten off most of the fish. It was only a mouth on a hook, really. Pretty creepy. When I was 12, I lived out in 29 Palms, California, in the middle of the desert. One night around June 14, 2015, I remember being awake in the middle of the night to a black silhouette that was shaped just like a short gray. It was staring straight down at me, and I was staring at its face. It had its hand on my forehead, and its skin was so abnormally smooth, soft, and warm. I was filled with pure love and tranquility. I intuitively knew that everything was going to be okay. My mind was completely clear of any thoughts, as if it was controlling my mind. And for some reason, it started making me count upward in my head. Once I got to three, I went unconscious. I eventually woke up again still laying in bed and everything in the room was the same except the entity was just gone. I sat up and immediately thought WTF was that and what just happened. I was able to think again and I was just so confused at what this all meant. I often question whether or not that intensely reassuring feeling was actually supposed to mean something. 
or if it was just a way for it to make me relax so it could do what it came to do. But I just don't understand why it seemed to have let me remember that moment instead of making me just forget the entire experience. I may not ever know. While backpacking through Yellowstone, my girlfriend and I found ourselves in grizzly territory for the first time. Black bears didn't bother us much, but grizzlies were a whole different story. After a tiring day of hiking, we set up camp for our second night. We cleaned up, had dinner, hung our scented items and food, and settled into bed. In the depths of my REM sleep, my girlfriend suddenly shook me awake, terrified by the sound of growling. Convinced that a bear had invaded our campsite, she had been gripped by fear. Instantly, I snapped awake, adrenaline coursing through my veins, ready for fight or flight. Without hesitation, I reached for the bear spray. For a tense minute, we sat in absolute silence, and then we heard the growling again. To our surprise, it wasn't a bear, it was something similar to Sasquatch. It was tall, hairy, bipedal, and human-like. Startled by our presence, he quickly fled the scene. It was November 2012 when I was working at a small gas station in Northeast Louisiana. We were the only small shop and 24-hour service station in Miles, just off the highway. I worked the night shift. I loved it the sharing of stories with the traveling customers. That is when the rare customer showed up. It must have been around 3 and out. I was cleaning the floors and locking the beer coolers when suddenly the lights went out. I pulled out my cell and used it as a guiding light until I made it back to our counter where I kicked on the gas generator. It lit the parking lot, the bath, and the hall leading to the register. When I looked outside, I could just make out the movement of the trees across the street, but otherwise it was pitch black. I turned on the radio and started listening to a local station with its night owl DJ, commenting on the heavy winds and cracking jokes between songs. Suddenly I saw some figures in the dark. I could just make them out. They seemed to be a group of kids on bikes. There were three of them. Two of them dropped their bikes and made their way to the door where they just stood there staring at me. I just stared back for a moment, waiting for them to come in. They never did. I moved around the counter and opened the door. What's up, guys? Out kinda late, aren't you? I asked them, expecting them to come in. Can we use your phone? One asked, their heads tilted kinda low. I felt a little worried as I pulled my cell from my pocket and offered it to her. Sure, she looked at me, and then I saw her eyes, they were solid black, almost like ink-filled orbs. No, I need the real one, she said her face twisted into an angry snarl. I pulled the door closed and flipped the locks. No, no ma'am, you go home and get your mom's phone. They stared at me through the door for a minute longer before turning away and biking off. The next day I had my boss check the cameras to get the pictures of the creepy kids, but the cameras had been off the whole time. Now the cameras run off the generator instead of the hall lights. I never saw the kids again. Three roommates and I went over to a friend's apartment not far from campus, but on a set of apartments in the middle of nowhere. We were just sitting in the living room watching TV, and I got up to go put a glass in the sink. Know how there is usually a window over the sink in most kitchens. So I'm washing this glass out, the light is on. There are no blinds on the window, just a curtain. I hear a sound at the window, and I look up just in time to see a hand hit the glass flat. I was like 20 years old, but I know I must have squealed or did some kind of girly scream, and the other three dudes came running in. I told them someone hit the glass. My buddy grabs his hunting rifle, and we run outside. By this time, 60 seconds have probably already passed. We get outside, and all we see is a bucket laying sideways under the window, along with the screen. There was a visible handprint on the window. Breakdown. Someone got a bucket to stand on, took the screen off the window and was trying to open it, when the bucket must have flipped from under them. Outside looking in, you could see through the kitchen and into the living room where we were sitting. 
This person would have easily seen me standing there, literally three feet from them on the other side of the window. There were four college-age guys inside, and this person was still trying to break in. One day in 23, I was walking down a bike path in the back of my house with my stepdaughter when I saw two boys leaning against their bikes up ahead. I didn't really think much about it since it is a bike path until one of the kids raised his head up and looked me straight in the eye. That's when fear struck me so hard I was stopped dead in my tracks. His eyes were black and hollow like he didn't have a soul. It was like looking at pure evil, at least that's the way I described it when I recounted the incident later that evening to my husband and my other daughter. I immediately led my stepdaughter off the path, cut through someone's yard, and walked out to the street. I didn't know what I had encountered at the time, but now I am quite sure it was the black-eyed children. I don't know what they are, but I know they are dangerous. It was so weird I thought that my stepdaughter would also be aware of what I perceived to be impending danger. But she was completely oblivious, even when I led her off the path and onto the street. I somehow knew I had to get out of there now. Surprisingly, they appeared normal in every other aspect, except for the eyes, of course, and a vague awareness that they didn't quite fit into the environment. I only saw the eyes of one of them because the other kid had his back on me. He looked to be around 13 or 14, flannel shirt and jeans, and a swarthy complexion. Now that I have been reading about these encounters, it piques my curiosity, but I wouldn't want to run into them again. Not my story, but a colleague's of mine. My colleague was responding to a call to check up on a camper. When he had pulled up, he noticed all the lights were out, which was strange considering the call was only made a few moments prior. When this ranger approached the tent, there was nothing, not a sound. It was as if everybody in the campsite had completely disappeared, leaving only him by himself. He was puzzled and not sure why somebody would make the call of this campsite and then be completely deserted. Then he described what he could hear as a weird growling noise with kind of a chewing sound. He shines his light over in the direction of this noise and sees this tiny three foot tall furry humanoid thing standing there that reminded him of a chimpanzee. He was completely startled and nearly falling backwards on his behind. This thing also had a very surprised expression on its face. Not really sure what to do, it quickly ran off scurrying between the branches and the trees and going at about 30 miles an hour. My colleague claims that it looked partly human, a brow ridge and a nose very much like a human does, but the rest of the face was almost covered in hair and reminded him very much of an ape. Besides the nose and the brow ridge, the eyes were also all black too, and it did not appear to be violent or aggressive in any way. As it turns out, the campers at this campsite were being harassed by this tiny little humanoid ape thing, which is the reason why they left soon after they made the call. Apparently, this thing was trying to get into one of their tents in which they were scared and got in their car and deserted their camp. After speaking to a few friends of mine who were heavily into cryptozoology, they all believed that a juvenile Sasquatch was responsible. Under the chilling midnight sky, my friend Dell and I drove along a desolate road, enveloped in an eerie silence. Unbeknownst to us, a life-altering encounter awaited. As our eyes scanned the darkness, a graceful four-point deer emerged, captivating our attention with its beauty. Little did we know, this sighting was merely a prelude to something far more extraordinary. On the left, the deer vanished into the shadows, diverting our gaze to the right. Dim moonlight revealed a figure that sent shivers down our spines a towering bipedal dogman. Its immense size filled us with a primal fear that transcended the limits of our understanding. Traversing the road, the creature's passage stirred the thick line of trees, setting them in motion. We stood transfixed, unable to avert our eyes from this mysterious being that defied explanation. It possessed an allure that was both enchanting and terrifying, hinting at an existence beyond our grasp. In that fleeting moment, a sense of otherworldliness saturated the air. 
The dogman's powerful stride seemed to bridge the gap between our reality and the unknown. Its presence invoked a mixture of awe and fear, captivating our senses with its enigmatic nature. Despite our yearning for clarity, the darkness concealed the creature's details. Yet, even in the absence of certainty, we recognized that we had borne witness to something extraordinary, a being that transcended the boundaries of our everyday existence. As the dogman dissolved into the night, our minds teemed with unanswered questions. Who was it? Where did it come from? This encounter ignited a fervent curiosity within us, driving us to explore the hidden enigmas lurking in the shadows. Since that bewitching moment, the memory of our encounter has etched itself permanently in our minds. The indelible mark left by the bipedal dogman serves as a reminder that our world is brimming with mysteries beyond the limits of our perception awaiting discovery. I was on our property in the Mount Hood National Forest in Western Oregon. I was making a new access road for equipment to get through and had been cutting with my chainsaw for some time when I decided to take a break. I pulled my earplugs out, which I normally leave in my ears. I sat there inspecting my work. Suddenly, something started crunching through the thick brush from down over the hillside in my direction straight at me. At first, I thought it was an elk, but the equipment noise should have kept the area clear of most animals, and I could tell it was cumbersome and lumbered along on two feet. I started straining my eyes to see what was coming through the thicket as it approached and got closer with every step. Finally, by the sound, I knew I should be seeing it because it wasn't more than 50 feet in the brush, but I couldn't make out any dark forms at all. It was November and all the leaves were gone off the trees and plants, so I had visibility of 200 feet. Suddenly, it came to a stop. It all went silent, extremely silent. There were no typical forest noises of any kind. I could feel that I was being watched, but why couldn't I see it? Anyway, I got tired of whatever it was playing games. I put my earplugs back in, fired up my saw, and went back to work, keeping my eyes down low just in case it let itself be seen. I knew it was watching me, but I wasn't going to give it the satisfaction of freaking me out. I trust the Lord to keep me safe, and that thing knew it. I didn't have anything else happen that day. But when I returned the next morning, something had taken all the brush I had stacked in piles along the new road and scattered it back in my way. Again, upon noticing this, I was peering through the woods around me with my senses on edge. When my two dogs came out to visit me, they quietly walked up behind me and stepped on some branches, breaking them. I about jumped into the next county. I went back to work restacking the brush, and nothing more happened. About six months later, though, I was in an area not far from there where I had been cutting all day, trying to get a section out of an old-growth fir log for carving. It was getting close to dusk, and I had my old Chevy pickup parked not far from me, about 40 feet away. I was preoccupied with what I was doing at the moment. But as I let my saw start a new cut down through the five-foot log, I glanced over at my truck and there standing alongside it, between me and the car, was a massive being, all black or dark brown and staring at me. I cursed under my breath because I really wasn't looking for a visit now. My truck is hot blue so this thing stood out really well against it. That rig is on 35-inch tires, a six-inch lift with the top of the cab being about seven feet tall, and this thing's head was quickly a foot taller than the truck. I didn't stare at it or want to make a lot of eye contact with it, but I noticed it was about four feet wide at the shoulders, and its arms hung down to its knees. It was very hairy and very solid. I'm no judge, but I'm assuming it had to have been at least 600 pounds if not more. The second I saw this thing standing there a cold shiver ran down me, but I didn't want it to think I saw it so I turned back to focus on my cutting. I didn't want to look back or head over to see if it was still there. It was now it was about 10 feet closer to me and standing more to my left near the hood of my truck. I could feel my heart pounding and I was getting a cold sweat too, but I went back to focusing on my work. I didn't look back for several minutes knowing that things could show up next to me or behind me without warning. 
I find the best thing to do is focus on what I'm doing and not look around and don't get let my imagination run away with me. It's easy to do out there in the dark with those Bigfoot being curious and coming around. I looked back up after five minutes and it was gone, thank God. But I'm sure it was standing in the dark there somewhere and I wasn't about to look around for it. I finished my work there, packed my tools and headed to the house without anything more occurring. The next day I went back, but after that I tried to get back before dusk. I had previously thought that they were kind of shy, but not after what I've seen. They're curious and will show up even if equipment or machinery is running. One summer, several years ago, I was spending an evening with a friend over in Washington at a rock pit we used to camp at quite a bit. Over a decade ago, she had her own encounters with the Bigfoot in which one walked up to her and her brother in the forest on Mount Hood. They were armed with the R-15s but were both frozen in fear. It got within five feet of them and just locked eyes with her. It was a nine to ten foot male and watched her intently for about a minute before turning its head and disappearing into the trees. They literally looked and looked for it, but it had vanished. This encounter happened in broad daylight. Anyway, they are amazing creatures. So this happened three years ago when I was living with my parents in Medici, Wyoming. Super small and secluded. It was Halloween and my parents decorated the house, and we expected about three, four kids to show up as the house is about a mile from a subdivision and parents usually drive their kids. At eight, I took in the chair with candy because I figured no one else would be coming around. I'm in the basement where there are no windows and very little sound can get out, and it's about 11. All the lights upstairs are shut off because I'm going to bed. I hear a knock at the side door which no one ever knocks at. I go upstairs and the floodlight which usually turns on automatically wasn't on. So I flipped on the other light that lights up the basketball hoop area. There's a person in one of those old man masks that have the crazy hair just standing there. He is just looking at the house. He sprints to the back where the patio is. I hear loud banging on the back windows. Honestly, the loudest kicking I've ever heard. I rush over and the person is just staring. Then he runs away and I do tea hear anything for five minutes or so. Then I start hearing the knob to the main door being forcefully jiggled back and forth. I ran upstairs to the bedroom and went to the crawl space in the attic. I immediately dialed 911. This was the first time I ever dialed 911 so I don't know what I was expecting, but the operator didn't seem to be very shocked or wanting to send out a car very quickly. I remember repeating my address like 12 times and the lady kept saying, calm down sir. She wants me to stay on the line. But I'm afraid if the guy got in, he would know where I was because of my voice. I hang up and I can hear the knob being slammed like he had a hammer or something. I'm having a full-on panic attack and I'm wheezing trying to get air. Then I hear the side door original door being kicked super hard. At this point I'm shaking so bad the dust from the floorboards is flying up in the air. I hear a window smash and I immediately know he's going to get in. I hold my breath, which makes the wheezing worse. I'm going to die. I'm listening to hear footsteps or anything. Nothing. The actual amount of time I spent up there was around 16 minutes. I swear it was an hour. An officer showed up and pounded on the door. I ran downstairs and flipped open the door. I told him everything as well as the backup sheriffs that got there. They all kept saying a friend was probably just trying to scare me. I had no friends in Wyoming. None. They looked around the house and wrote down some shit, but nothing really happened. They left and I drove behind them to Cody, Wyoming and got a hotel room. I still can't sleep without all the lights on and a .45 on my dresser. Hello. I read some of your Ouija board stories. I have one that I believe proves that these boards can become haunted. My father used to buy things from eBay, then sell it at their actual price. One day he purchased an old Ouija board. Its box portrayed it as a game, fun for the whole family. None of my siblings played with it though and neither did I. 
Then a few days after the board arrived, weird things started to happen even though no one touched the board. It was on a shelf in the garage. One night, the first of many nights, I woke at 3.33 a.m. exactly. I woke up scared for no reason. No nightmare, just scared with a very bad feeling. I'd always just lay there awake, then turn over and try to go back to sleep. This first night, I turned over and tried to go back to sleep. But when I turned and laid my head on my pillow, I immediately heard a man's voice that said directly into the ear, go back to sleep. I jumped up and woke my sister who shared a room with me. I was crying and terribly scared. The voice wasn't my father's. No man another than my father lived with us. Another day at home, I was watching a movie alone. I paused the movie and took the remote with me to the bathroom. When I came back to disc was out and place on the table next to the TV. The disc drive on the Xbox was open and my room was tossed all over. It was a mess. Another time in the same house, I left the kitchen and heard something behind me. When I turned I saw a man in a red flannel shirt behind me, though I heard no doors open. I ran from him and turned back around and he was gone. My father soon sold the board and we moved soon after. I've had nothing weird or paranormal happen since. This story takes place during a rafting trip on the Deschutes River in central Oregon. My girlfriend and I had decided to drive down from the Seattle area for the famous salmon fly hatch. With that being said, due to the timing of the year, there's a ton of people on the water. Guides doing day trips, as well as other folks like my girlfriend, and I spending a couple days fishing, floating, and camping. Our first day of the trip goes by pretty poorly. I had a crappy boat and no idea what I was doing. Dry bags leaked, I hit a rock and got us a sizable leak, and then had forgotten the bucket so I spent the rest of the trip bailing out the boat with a water bottle non-stop. So needless to say, we're both pretty frustrated and tired, and as the day turns to dusk we're scouting out any possible spot to throw our tent up for the evening and get out of that crappy boat. Finally things are looking up for us, we come up on this beautiful stretch of water with a small island, diverting the river into two flows, with the main flow going along the deep left channel at a pretty good clip. On the right side bank a big clearing surrounded by tall grasses. This is where we chose to make camp for the night. We do some fishing, cook, and decide to lay down for bed and read until it's time to really go to sleep at full dark. Going out to take a leak nobody as far as I could see or hear had decided to camp anywhere near us, and prior to a few boats floating on by while we set up camp as far as we knew, we were alone. That's when the music started. At first it sounded almost faintly like someone was throwing a rave with dance music and the like. My girlfriend and I looked at each other like, what the hell? But we chalked it up to the wind carrying sound from far away because at this point the music was still intermittent. It gets louder and louder and now we can make out the music except it's not. You know that feeling when someone is blasting the bass out of their car subwoofers and you can feel it in your chest and in your head? We're feeling there, whoever they are, music through the ground as we're trying to sleep. And all we can hear is this unworldly, jarring collection of disjointed bass or drum notes coming through the ground. It doesn't resemble any music I've ever heard, or even any sort of beat you could dance to. By midnight or 1am we're starting to getting really damn pissed off. It has been since around 10pm since they started, and so that's when I finally decide to go find whoever the hell they are and shut down that damn noise. I have one of those really powerful headlights that lets you output like 1E500 lumens for a short burst, and it really just lights up the whole damned countryside for hundreds of feet. So all pissed off I jump out of the tent and turn up my headlight of doom, and I'm just furiously scanning everywhere I can see. Up and down the river, behind us as far as I can on our own bank, across clear to the other bank, and the little island in the middle. And there's not a single thing in sight complete pitch darkness. I turn off my headlight to see if I was washing out any light and I stand there for about 10 minutes to see if my eyes adjust and see anything. Absolutely nothing at all and this maddening noise is going on endlessly. 
At this point I realize it's the same three disjointed songs playing over and over endlessly. My girlfriend starts crying because she's exhausted from the bass rattling our skulls while our heads on laying down on our pillows. We're unable to sleep for hours as this thing continues on through the night. Finally, sometime around 4.35 a.m., it must have stopped and we both drifted off to sleep. I have a hard time sleeping and so I woke up by myself at around 6.37 and I roll out of bed furious, once more just going out to go see if I can find whatever bastards were making that noise all night long. We never saw or found any sign of those people. We waited until about 9 a.m. slowly breaking camp after eating breakfast before we rode out in the main current and back road to try to get a good look at the other side of the small island, and we saw no signs of people. The only reasonable theory we have is that sometime after we went to bed, some folks floated down to the far side of the little island and threw some sort of party ritual all through the night and somehow slipped out between 4.30 and 6.30 a.m. If I wasn't with my girlfriend and she hadn't corroborated as well, I would have thought I was going insane. Just one long, maddening, sleepless night full of the same noise over and over, with no evidence before, during, or after that it ever happened. I was at a summer camp that separated boys from the girls. We would normally sleep in separate cabins, however this being a nice night, our counselors decided it would be nice to camp outside. Being overly tested or in high schoolers given new freedom of the outdoors, we decided to separate from our supervision and beeline for the girls' campsite. Upon successfully reaching their site and being dumbfounded at what to do, we decided that throwing miscellaneous items into the fire, creating subsequent explosions, would be a good icebreaker. Unfortunately, due to our brilliance, we were quickly brought back to our camp and separated from the girls. Not being discouraged, we decided to regroup and try again. As we began to leave for their sight again, we heard an extremely loud bang, as if from a high-caliber rifle. The sound was followed by another bang, followed by silence. We all became paralyzed, unsure what to do. Was it from the girls' sight? We were too afraid to find out. We could see a flashlight in the distance mulling around the area. I only remember lying quietly, barely able to sleep, joking with fellow campers who would get shot first if that bang was indeed from a gun. The next morning we woke up, alive and very confused to what had happened. I actually only found out what had happened when I got home from camp. A man had shot his ex at a house right by the campsite we were staying that night. What stood out to me the most, other than aforementioned, was an interview with a neighbor who didn't call the police right away, because she figured the sound was from some stupid kids blowing up things at a campsite. I led a small expedition of 12 Marines, tasked with recovering a downed aircraft rumored to have encountered a massive, unknown sea creature. It was a mission shrouded in mystery, and our team was a mix of experienced soldiers and unique individuals. One such individual was Jack, a fellow Marine who, in his free time, embraced his love for gambling and dabbled in the world of acting. We descended into the depths, our hearts pounding with anticipation. The murky waters swallowed us whole, enveloping us in a realm where light struggled to penetrate. We maneuvered cautiously, scanning the underwater landscape, until our eyes widened in disbelief. There it was a sunken aircraft resting on the ocean floor. As we swam closer to investigate, the sense of danger grew palpable. Suddenly, without warning, a colossal aquatic predator materialized before us. Its sheer size defied all logic, dwarfing even the wreckage of the downed aircraft. The beast's enormous jaws gaped wide, revealing rows of razor-sharp teeth that gleamed menacingly in the dim light. Panic and chaos ensued as the creature lunged towards us, its fury unleashed. The water churned with violence as we fought desperately to survive. Harpoons were thrown with precision, aiming for vulnerable spots, while gunfire echoed through the depths. Jack, with his quick thinking, managed to shoot the creature directly in its eyes, momentarily stunning it. Exploiting the creature's temporary vulnerability, 
we launched our final assault. Grenades were hurled with deadly accuracy, finding their mark in the creature's gaping maw. The water erupted in a cataclysmic explosion as the beast thrashed in its death throes. It was a battle of survival, a fight against an ancient leviathan that threatened to unleash chaos upon the world. But victory came at a devastating cost. Ten of my comrades, brave marines who had faced the unimaginable with unwavering resolve, met their untimely end in the jaws of the creature. Only Jack and I emerged from the depths, battered but alive. As we floated in the water, a mixture of relief and sorrow washed over us. The beast that had haunted us had been vanquished, but the sacrifice of our fallen comrades would forever weigh heavy on our hearts. We resurfaced, the sun welcoming us back into its warm embrace. The ocean, once a serene backdrop, now held the memories of a battle fought and lives lost. With the mission complete, we returned to our base, determined to honor the fallen. The Appalachian Trail stretches before me, a winding path that weaves through the breathtaking beauty of the dense woods. Towering trees stand tall, their branches reaching towards the sky, as if inviting me to explore their secrets. It's my first day as a park ranger, and the excitement bubbles within me like a rushing stream. My name is Ron, a nature enthusiast with a love for the wilderness, camping, and cats. As I embark on my journey along this renowned trail, I can't help but feel a mixture of awe and trepidation. Rumors of strange occurrences that have taken place here whisper through the air, adding an air of mystery to my new role. Eager to acquaint myself with the surroundings, I delve deeper into the trail, my senses heightened, absorbing every sound and shadow that dances around me. The forest comes alive with strange apparitions, fleeting glimpses of figures that seem to vanish as quickly as they appear. Eerie sounds echo through the trees, causing my heart to skip a beat. As I continue my patrol, my ears catch a distant sound that piques my curiosity. Intrigued, I follow the trail towards the source, my steps cautious but filled with a mix of fear and anticipation. The air grows heavy, and a chill runs down my spine as I come face to face with a creature beyond my wildest imagination. Before me stands a dogman, a beast with the body of a bipedal wolf and a face that resembles that of a human. Its eyes meet mine, a gaze filled with primal intelligence and hunger. I fumble for my mobile, desperate to capture evidence of this unearthly encounter, but my hands tremble, and the foam slips from my grasp, crashing to the ground. The dogman, alerted by the sound, charges towards me with a fury I could not have fathomed. Instinct kicks in, and I draw upon my training, grappling with the beast in a desperate struggle for survival. Adrenaline surges through my veins as I manage to grab hold of a knife, slashing at the creature's throat. It collapses to the ground, lifeless. Breathing heavily, disbelief courses through my veins as I stare at the fallen dogman. This extraordinary creature, the stuff of legends, now lies motionless at my feet. Fumbling to retrieve my broken phone, I attempt to capture proof of this extraordinary encounter, only to find it useless, shattered beyond repair. Doubt gnaws at the edges of my mind as I return to the trail, my footsteps heavy with the weight of what I've witnessed. Determined to seek assistance and share my unbelievable tale, I make my way back to the park ranger station to inform my senior colleague. Together, we return to the spot where the dogman had fallen, only to find an empty clearing. I honestly don't know how to explain what had happened to me. I believe I saw some sort of Native American entity. I was working as a ranger for the city of Austin, Texas. I just had one left of our reserve campsites when a very strange thing occurred. This was about 10.30 at night. I was driving my four-wheel drive pickup truck on a dirt road that led back to the entrance of the park. The area is a wooded hillside spanning 200 acres and contains a very large number of wildlife. So, being nighttime and how many animals are nocturnal, I was watching up for signs of their movement on either side of me. It was quiet, and I was the only one around. 
I had been following the road closely when I got this strong sensation, the road, everything around it, dense woods. I looked up just as a deer ran out in front of my truck directly in my path. It was something like 40 yards ahead of me when I saw it. I reacted immediately by pulling onto the shoulder, slamming my brakes. The deer now was only about 10 feet away from my truck when I swerved, and it vanished as soon as it went out of sight. The feeling that it told me to look up subsided. Everything went back to normal. There were no other cars on the road, of course, being just mine. I sat in place, trying to collect my bearings. My heart was beating fast, and I had a headache, and I couldn't explain these feelings. What on earth? So something brought my attention to the hillside, right where the deer had come from, and that's when I saw movement about 50 yards into the brush. It wasn't clear. I got out of my truck to inspect and walked up to the spot where I thought I had seen the movement through the tree line. The woods were pretty thick, but about 20 feet into them, there was a small opening in trees with lower branches and ones that were not as wide or tall. They almost kind of formed a natural corridor that maybe, I'd say 50 yards opened up to the hillside before becoming obscured by the other trees and foliage. The ground sloped slightly upward many leaves. I called out with my flashlight, thinking, why would there be somebody out here? It didn't make any sense. Thinking maybe I was just seeing things or it might be another deer. There was no answer and that was it. I assumed it was just my own paranoia. Now I didn't hear anything move past me, so I decided to inspect further because why not? Calling out loudly I knew at least, I'm pretty sure I saw a movement. And again, there should be no reason at all why anybody should be this far out here late at night. The movement I saw was more like a person, not a deer, at least I'm sure of it. So I kind of very shortly walked up the hillside, never hearing a sound. I decided finally that okay, enough is enough. I'm gonna leave and head back to my truck. As soon as I got in, I realized there was something wrong, something strange and paranormal if you will. As soon as I got back in my truck, that's when I saw it coming out of the woods ahead of me, slightly up from where the deer emerged. It is what I can only unmistakably describe as an apparition. It was this glowing, translucent being, but unmistakably a spirit. It shimmered, seeming to be faint, but nearly transparent. It came closer to my truck and appeared as if it were getting bigger, but also darker and more solid at the same time. It was this light grayish color, and then would grow darker in color, kind of pulsating. It just walked right past the front of my truck with no fear or concern about my presence whatsoever. It just walked by like nothing was there, with some kind of purposeful stride, without having so much as even a look of curiosity. And then, right there in my view, it just vanished, fading into obscurity. Not wasting a second, I flew my vehicle out of there, and my only mission in that moment was to go, 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 go. Before this, I thought ghosts were a joke. I had never been a believer in the paranormal or what many refer to as the spirit realm. But after this, that changed my mind, and I'll never forget what I saw. But it wasn't until the following morning when I really kind of fully mentally processed what I saw, surprisingly because I didn't sleep that much. But a thought occurred to me, and I realized what it really happened. What I saw looked like a stereotypical image of a native, long hair down to its shoulders, feathers, a headdress, actually. My professional theory is that somebody, a Native American, has gone through this road many times before in their lifetime, and they're simply showing me something that happened here at some point along the way. Maybe they stumbled upon these woods at night, and for whatever reason, they were killed on the spot by first contact European settlers, who probably had no qualms about killing anybody different than them, including women and children. I do not believe this entity or spirit to have been malicious. It didn't come off as that. It was just something that happened to them in their lifetime. This spirit was merely doing whatever some non-physical thing does when in the process of trying to relive what happened. It's a possibility that this spot is where these people might have been killed or injured in an altercation. Maybe they were stuck between this world and the next. I don't know. Maybe they've seen my truck hundreds of times out here late at night over the years, and now I'm able to pick up on whatever happens to come through here. Who knows? 
Anyway, that's my experience with the paranormal. Hopefully, it will be my last. I have family in law enforcement, and I found these old archive files. Well, my grandfather did because he has access to documents. This is an old printout of something that I found very interesting, so I thought I would share it with you. Here you go. May 22, 1984 Officer LG was patrolling the area around a local park during the night shift. At approximately 1.25 a.m., the officer reported veering off course to investigate flashing lights in an adjacent wooded section of the city. Spotting several bright lights slowly hovering along the tree line, as he drove closer to investigate, his vehicle reportedly lost power and stalled. As he approached, an object described as having a dark body with many bright lights hovered silently above him, roughly 300 feet away. The object allegedly reeled out some type of thin black cord, which struck and wrapped around his police car as it backed away from him. The object then took off into the air and disappeared into darkness. Officer LG wrote his account of the event on May 24, 1984. The following day, he reported the incident to command, who denied anything had happened and insisted that his vehicle was in perfect working order. Officer LG's police cruiser was inspected by technicians at the city garage, who found nothing wrong with it mechanically. No evidence of alterations or unusual damage were noted after inspection. No support for Officer LG's claim would come from local authorities until three months later when another officer, Officer F, called into dispatch, reporting a very similar object near the same park, along with reports of several other officers who had also spotted strange lights descending toward a tree line, then vanishing without explanation. Thereafter, Officer F and Officer LG were reportedly ridiculed by command to stop spreading rumors, ultimately leading to Officer LG being permanently dismissed from duty. I was recently working near a river in the British Columbia wilderness, when about 20 meters from me and my co-worker we heard loud footsteps crashing through the trees. My co-worker yelled out, Nothing, the footsteps continued, but after he yelled out a second time, the footsteps stopped, and then things went completely silent. There was other people in the vicinity throughout the week, but to our knowledge, nobody there that day. I grew up hunting, and I am very familiar with the fauna of Western Canada. It sounded like a bull or cow moose or elk, perhaps a sizable buck. But to my knowledge, they don't have the smarts to actively hide from humans when they are yelled at. Same with bears. Mountain lions, however, do. But I don't believe one would ever be so loud and clumsy sounding. WTF was in the woods. I'm not above thinking it was perhaps a Bigfoot. Or was it a sinister person? In 2014, I was living with my then girlfriend, now wife and our son in a forest house close to the center of Bolton and Northwest England. The house is what we call a two-up, two-down here because they have two rooms upstairs and two rooms downstairs. The stairs ran down the kitchen side of the wall that divided the two downstairs rooms. My girlfriend was working on a course to become a veterinary nurse. For this, she had to work the 2 p.m. to 11 p.m. shifts, so there was just me and my son in the house. I had put him to bed a few hours before and was now downstairs washing the pot and pans. I heard footsteps on the landing and assumed it was my son, thinking he had woken up and was now running around upstairs looking for us, as he was apt to do. I dried my hands and prepared to go through the routine of putting him back to bed, but I noticed these were not the erratic footsteps of a child, but the heavy deliberate footsteps of an adult. The footsteps began to descend the stairs. I turned to see not my son, but a tall woman dressed in a long white gown. As her head came into view, I could see she was well over six feet tall and had long blonde hair. The stairs curved to the left as they approached the ground. As this woman rounded the corner, I saw her face. She looked odd. Her features were human, but something was off about them, like she was something imitating a human. As she took the last step towards the floor, she vanished. 
I stood still in shock for a few moments, but then plucked up the courage to go upstairs and check on my son. Thankfully, he was still fast asleep. About half an hour later, my girlfriend got home. I was still slightly shaken up, but happy to see another real human. She wasn't all that surprised, which was a bit unnerving. She had lived there for a few years before I met her and most people who visited experienced something in that house. Mostly knocks and bangs at all hours and ghost cats. The bangs could have been the neighbors to be fair. Having to tell people the cat they just saw run through the house isn't your cat is always a fun conversation. Thankfully, the full body apparitions weren't all that common. So my friend told me this story and swears it's true. It still sends chills down my spine every time I think about it. So it's a story of his friend, who's also a skilled hunter named Joe, a man who played guitar in local indie band, and an experienced tracker. One fateful day, Joe embarked on a solo expedition deep into the wilderness of New Mexico, unaware of that that awaited him. It started out like any other hunting trip, the crisp air of the wilderness was there as he ventured into the heart of nature, his rifle by his side and a sense of anticipation in his veins. He had his sights set on an elk, a creature whose meat would sustain him through the coming months. As the sun began its descent, casting long shadows across the landscape, he finally spotted the perfect target. With steady hands and focused determination, he aimed and fired the sound of the gunshot shattering the tranquil silence of the forest. The elk fell, and he felt a mix of pride and relief. But then, things started to go awry. As he approached the fallen elk, a strange sensation washed over him. It was as if a pair of eyes were piercing through the dense foliage, watching his every move. He brushed it off as mere paranoia, attributing it to the isolation of the wilderness. Yet, as he reached down to claim his prize, a roar echoed through the trees, shaking him to the core. He froze, his heart pounding in his chest, as he turned to face the source of the terrifying sound. What he saw defied all logic and reason. Standing before him was a massive bipedal creature, towering over like a Bigfoot. Before he could react, the creature lunged at him with lightning speed, its powerful fist connecting with his jaw. He crumpled to the ground, disoriented and in pain, as it swiftly grabbed the elk carcass, tearing it away from his grasp. The creature vanished into the wilderness, leaving him in a state of shock and disbelief. So he sat there, trying to make sense of what had just happened. He says it felt like a nightmare, but the ache in he jaw and the lingering taste of blood confirmed its chilling reality. No matter how hard he tried, he couldn't shake off the image of that immense creature stealing his kill. He still swears it's a true story. Do with this story what you want. Ex-Royal Navy Lieutenant here. Back in 26, the ship I was on H.S. York was crossing the Bay of Biscay when we found a single empty survival suit floating around. When it was first spotted, we thought it was a body, but when we put a boat out to check it out, it turned out to be empty probably fell off a container ship in a storm or something totally normal. Or maybe something else spooky or whatever. That was kind of creepy, but not really. We bend it almost immediately. Of course, there's nothing your average sailor likes more than gossip and exaggeration. So within a matter of hours, there were rumors sweeping the lower decks that the guys who picked it up out of the water had found blood, or body parts, or bite marks, or anything else someone could make up classic sailor rumor monitoring action. A few days later, I had one of the younger and more gullible lads 17 or 18 years old in my division asked to speak to me in private and tell me that he was scared that he'd get eaten by a sea monster if he went overboard. Naturally, I told him we'd do our best to get him out of the water before any of the local wildlife could get a proper hold on him. Job's a good un. Around about 20 years ago, I worked for the Big Boy Scout Ranch in New Mexico. Philmont. Google it. It's gorgeous. The ranch itself is divided up into little regional support zones. 
you have a base camp where all these backpacking hiker scouts would come in. Ages of about 14, 21 sometimes with their parents, but generally chaperoned in some way, and oftentimes a mix of guys and girls. So these kids, and I use the word kid loosely, because hey, I'm old, and all you 20-somethings are kids to me. It's not an insult, it's just perspective. Would go through an initial training period, and then be set loose on the ranch. They'd get an itinerary, telling them to be at X place at Y time, and then off they'd go. Knocking out their 100 plus mile course over 10 days to three weeks. I have to admit it was pretty awesome as a scout. It was a grand experience, and at $350 a kid for two weeks, it was pretty cheap. So anyway, regional zones of control. Scattered throughout the ranch, there were maybe 100, 120 primitive camping sites. Some place to drop your gear, get water, take a dump, whatever. You might be on the trail for two, three days before you got to one of the 34, 36 staffed backcountry camps. A backcountry camp had a staff of three, six, depending on the size and activity. The activity was some sort of Old West style skill that they would then teach the kids. Maybe it's gold panning or deep rock mining, shotguns, burrow racing, compass and starlight navigation, whatever. I worked at three separate backcountry camps during my years as staff. This would have been the summer of 90s. There were a number of bear attacks that year, more than a dozen. There were also two mountain lion attacks that thankfully the news agencies ignored. Come to think of it, I was stalked twice, each time for more than 30 minutes. I worked at Harlan Camp, a backcountry camp with guns, specifically shotguns. Full NR a certified range and donation of four gorgeous Ruger Red Label over under 12 gauge shotguns. We'd spend the mornings teaching kids to reload birdshot shells and spend the afternoons blazing away at clay pigeons. We also had burrows. Think of them as shorter, more pissed off donkeys. We'd name them and then just after dinner the kids would be assigned a burrow and flog them up and down the valley in a race and we'd watch every time and pray that the kids wouldn't get their face kicked in. But when we weren't teaching the kids, we maintained an active search area of about 24 square miles around our little backcountry heaven. We were all search and rescue trained. Occasionally, a half crew of bewildered campers would hit our front porch and tell us that someone had fallen and broken a leg or needed to be similarly evac'd. So this is really just one story of many. Our camp also bordered the highway, and we often had weirdos try and hike up the jeep trail from the road. We'd have to corral these people and escort them off the ranch. Once at gunpoint. Spooky tale starts here. So it's just after midnight. Late part of the season, maybe the first or second weekend of September. Weather starting to change, the nights came earlier. The camp had finally quieted down and we'd wrapped up the last bear patrol of the evening. Basically running around and making sure some dumbass kid hadn't dumped powdered Gatorade on a stump again in the hopes of luring a bear to his campsite. The bulk of the campers were asleep by about 9 p.m.-ish. On these nights, there was one lone light on the staff cabin, really just bright enough for you to find your way to the shitter and back without getting lost. No moon this night but the starlight could still be pretty incredible. Were it not so overcast, we're sitting there on the front porch. Three of us. The camp director is inside. We're cleaning the guns. I can still remember the smell of the solvent. Big black glass bottle. We just slid the guns back into the safe and we were locking up when it started. Screaming. Sounded like a person. Sounded like several. Women. Screaming. I've never heard anything like it before or since, but distant, and close all at the same time. I looked at my buddy, and we both grabbed our guns and reached for the emergency loads. One shell of tightly packed power that made one hell of a noise, and one shell loaded with zeros and buckshot that we didn't let the kids use. We booked it out to the burrow pens, only to find the burrows not there. They had a square enclosure and a sort of long run that opened up to a small fence pasture and a hayloft about 20 feet tall. So we make it through the gate and the screaming is much worse. Maybe two minutes have passed since we stepped off the cabin porch. 
I'm in the best shape of my life at this point, but still my heart was pounding so hard I could hear it. I could feel the blood pumping in my ears I was so on edge. We moved back into the enclosure, spread out, so as not to accidentally blow each other in half. The screaming changed, shifted from high pitch to something more guttural, more like a low, hoarse, raspy growl. Sounded huge moving through the tree lines just outside the fence. We finally get to the burrows. They're all bunched up by the fence line. They see us and come running over, like we're part of the herd or something. They're shaking, and in the cool, crisp air, they're sweating, like they've been sprinting back and forth in the pen. The screaming stops. The whatever the F it was moves back into the tree. My buddy takes aim and fires his noise load. But this did not hasten the withdrawal of the creature. We'd packed the noise loads two months previous in celebration of the 4th of July. We'd hiked up to the ridge, and at midnight, our guns had belted fire into the sky. The thunderous rapport was reported heard from the other camps up the valley, 20 miles away. Fitting since it took two days for my ears to stop ringing. The creature took its time leaving. Huge bushes shook when it made its way through them. We hung around with the burrows till dawn. Took turns sleeping in the hayloft just in case. The burrows. Best to think of them like big dogs seemed overjoyed to have us there. Leaping and jumping about. When the sun came up, I saw the blood. Blood on the hooves of the burrows. Blood in the pasture. Blood on the fence. Blood splattered on hay. Blood on our boots and jeans where we'd failed to see what we were standing in the night before. I followed the blood trail up the ravine wall that the fence pasture backed up to. I didn't have to go more than 20 or 30 years before I found what was left of it. Big mountain lion, probably male I couldn't tell, got into the burrow pen, probably thinking he could take one down. Goddamned burrows stomped the F to death. Its rear legs were practically sheared off, crushed pelvis and lower spine twisted and exposed. It didn't react to the noise from the shotgun because it couldn't. It just wanted to get away from there before it died. My grandfather was on the USS Block Island when it was sunk off the coast of Italy in 1944. Six men lost and 951 were rescued by the other ships in the fleet. When the ship was hit, obviously the evacuation was immediate. No time to grab personal effects, just grab a life vest and get the F out. Eventually my grandfather was plucked out of the water by a marine on another vessel. Fast forward to 1966. My grandfather was working in a hangar in the Norfolk, Virginia naval base. Right as he was getting ready to wrap up his work for the day, he was approached by two men in suits. They were FBI. FBI, are you X? Grandpa, yes. FBI, were you on the USS Block Island in 1944? Yes. Were you issued a 9 milometer pistol, serial 12,345,678? I believe so. Minutes. Do you know where that pistol is right now? At the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean as far as I know. Turns out that as the ship was being evacuated and someone grabbed some weapons, or at least this particular one out of the armory, the weapon somehow found its way to the U.S. and had been found at the scene of a mob murder the two weeks earlier in New York City. Edit. Now that I am thinking about it, their rescue was pretty badass too and worth telling. The other ships in the fleet sailed, full speed towards the floating survivors. Then cut their engines to avoid detection from the U-boat's radar, I guess. And their momentum allowed them to drift through the survivors and pick them up. My grandfather said he tread water for hours before finally being scooped out of the ocean. Most of the guys had life vests, but they only helped keep them afloat for a little while, and they had to share them. He said he didn't have enough strength to pull himself up onto the rescuing vessel, and that the marine that pulled him out of the water was one of the largest men he had ever seen in his life. As the block island sank, the survivors heard an explosion. They were pretty sure it was the sound of the block island exploding either as a result of the water pressure on the munitions, or maybe something in the ship was still burning and caught munitions. 
or the ship's fuel supply. No matter the case, they were pretty sure the sound came from their sinking ship because of the direction it came from. The German sub that hit them thought the explosion was the sound of them being hit and surfaced to assess the damage. When the Germans surfaced, the rest of the fleet blew the U-boat out of the water. I was RV camping with my Irish wolfhound, Marty, last summer. We were in an old camping ground outside of Naples, Florida. Marty wanted out around 10 p.m. that night. Not long after I let him out, I heard a loud yelping from the swamp. I immediately flooded the area with my handheld spotlight, calling out to Marty. That's when I saw an unusual creature with eyes that glowed brilliant orange. The creature was yellowish brown, two half feet tall bipedal with several foot long spines on the back. It was hunched over Marty, sucking blood out of, of his neck. It screeched at me and ran off. Marty's neck had two fang marks as he laid lifeless. I heard another scream nearby, so I picked up Marty's body and headed home to the 24-hour vet. The vet said he had never seen this before and confirmed that Marty had been drained of blood. He mentioned El Chupacabras from his home in Puerto Rico, but said he had never seen one and thought his was a myth. So I'm not a skeptic or anything. I just haven't dealt with much paranormal related stuff because I steered clear of anything that could potentially haunt me. So no dolls, mirrors, paintings, etc. About a year ago, when I was staying up late sometimes, I would hear this extremely loud breathing, or at least some sort of airy movement that went on for 30 seconds whilst I just listened. It sounded the same and just as clear even if I was in different locations for each separate occurrence. Once in the bedroom, once in the living room, and once in the home office. On the second floor it happened in several month intervals and it sounded consistent or mechanical perhaps. Enough that I figured there must be some sort of normal explanation. The house is very new, to many tennis, no basement, no dark past or anything. What could explain that? Thank you. My name is Emily, and I've always had a deep love for the wilderness. Becoming a park ranger was a dream come true. I had envisioned my days filled with fresh air, breathtaking vistas, and the gentle rustle of leaves. But nothing could have prepared me for what awaited at Hollow Pines National Park. It started innocently enough. The park superintendent assigned me to the Hollow Pines Ranger Station. As I drove deeper into the forest, the towering pines seemed to close in around me. The isolation was palpable, and the deafening silence only intensified my unease. It was like the forest held its breath, waiting. The ranger station itself was a relic of the past, a wooden structure with peeling paint and a sagging roof. Inside, the air was heavy with the weight of years gone by, and the walls seemed to echo with secrets. The previous rangers had left abruptly, leaving behind half-finished cups of coffee, personal effects scattered about, and journals filled with cryptic entries. I tried to dismiss the sense of foreboding that settled over me as I settled into my new home. Each night, I would sit by the creaking fireplace, poring over the old journals. The stories they contained were haunting. Tales of shadows that moved on their own, eerie whispers in the wind, and a feeling of being constantly watched. My fellow rangers had written of inexplicable fear that had gnawed at their sanity. One particularly chilling entry described a night when the forest came alive. Trees bent and twisted in unnatural ways, their branches forming grotesque shapes. The wind carried strange voices that seemed to speak directly into the rangers' minds. It was as though the forest itself had a malevolent consciousness. As the days turned into weeks, I couldn't shake the feeling of being observed. The isolation was overwhelming. One evening, as I sat reading an old journal, I heard a voice. Soft and delicate, it whispered my name, Emily. My heart raced as I searched the empty room, finding nothing amiss. I told myself it was my imagination playing tricks on me. But the whispers continued. 
They followed me wherever I went, faint and barely audible, but undeniably there. Emily. The voice seemed to come from the very walls of the ranger station, as if the building itself held a dark secret. The nights grew longer, and my sleep was plagued by nightmares. I would dream of twisted trees with gnarled branches reaching out to grasp me, their roots pulling me down into the earth. In my dreams, I could hear the voices of the previous rangers, their faces twisted in agony, warning me to leave before it was too late. One stormy night, the forest unleashed its fury. Thunder rumbled overhead, and lightning tore through the sky. The wind howled like a wounded beast, and rain pounded on the roof of the ranger station. It was then that I heard it, a chilling cry that rose above the storm, a cry that was not of this world. I grabbed a flashlight and ventured outside, my heart pounding in my chest. Through the rain and darkness, I saw them shadowy figures moving among the trees, their forms flickering in and out of existence. The whispers grew louder, an unintelligible cacophony of voices that seemed to come from all directions. In a panic, I stumbled back into the ranger station and locked the door. The voices followed me, seeping through the walls, invading my mind. I felt myself losing control, my thoughts slipping away. It was as though the forest itself had claimed me. I don't know how long I remained trapped in that nightmare, but when I awoke, the storm had passed, and the forest was silent once more. I packed my belongings and left the Hollow Pines ranger station, leaving behind the haunted memories that still haunt my dreams. To this day, I can hear the whispers, faint but persistent. They follow me wherever I go, a reminder of the malevolent force that lurks within the Hollow Pines National Park, a force that will never let go of its hold on those who dare to enter its domain. I'm typing this just as I got home and I'm getting more creeped out the more I think about this. So me and two friends were in the woods at a sort of park just outside of town. There's a cool scrapyard with a bunch of old quarry equipment that we were checking out, and by the time we're about to leave it's gone from dusk to dark. We use the flashlights on our phone to navigate out of the scrapyard until we get to the trail. Getting ready for a 10 minutes walk out, we decide to cut the lights and see if our eyes will adjust. This scrapyard's in an open part of the woods, and we were just going back into the tree line on the trail when I heard a stick crack and leaves rustling right to our left, about five feet in front of us right off the trail. Not knowing what this was, I stopped walking for a sec to make sure I wasn't just hearing things. I couldn't really see anything, but as I was pulling out my phone to turn on the flashlight, this weird, deep, but loud growl came from right in front of us. Right away, we all just sprinted away and back towards the scrapyard. We decided to go through the scrapyard and onto the trail on the other side that led right out to the road. But a 15 men walk away from the parking lot where my car was. When we got back to my car, there was a police car parked in front of me, blocking my car off. We saw the cop at the entrance to the trails with a flashlight on and waited for her to come to us. She asked us if we had seen a person in the woods and described him as five feet seven, wearing all black with long blonde hair. We asked her if he was missing, and she said no, he's not a missing person, but they're looking for him. We told her we hadn't, and she took our names and we left. Upon leaving, we saw a total of 11 cop cars spread out, some together along this road beside the woods. I originally thought that we encountered a black bear. However, my friend who was with us hunts a lot, and said it definitely wasn't a bear, and in fact he had never heard an animal make a growl like that before, and I have to admit, neither have I. The growl sounded weirdly human, almost too perfectly scary. Plus, if it was a bear, by running away we would have been mauled. I'm really confused and honestly creeped out. We've looked at several videos of different animals growling, but there's not too many where I live. Was it the guy the police were looking for? Was he insane or something? If it was this guy who growled at us, why? We are going back to the spot tomorrow, this time with some bear mace and knives, etc. Just in case to see if we can find any bear paw prints anywhere around. Update 1. According to our local Facebook groups, it was just a guy who was lost, and police located him about half an hour after we left. 
We did tell the police about where we heard the bear. Maybe it was something else. Maybe the guy was actually crazy. Going back there in half an hour, he'll keep updating. Update 2. We went back to the spot this morning and spent about an hour looking around for any clues as to what was growling at us. We couldn't see any prints or anything indicating something else was there. At this point, we're all still confused and I think it's going to stay that way. Angler here. One night, while at my favorite fishing spot, my friend and I heard a noise. Now this sounded like some rustling about 10 feet or 3 meter away in some bushes. Now my friend called it off as just a rabbit, but I insisted on listening. Now that was no rabbit, but instead steps. Well, in the region I'm from, we have quite a lot of coyotes. So we pass it off as a mangy, curious beast catching a glimpse of our fire. So to progress the night and feel easy, we began to make noise and toss sticks and rocks to the bush. After a lengthy sit by the fire and a few more pops, we headed home, leaving a few belongings behind. Well, when we returned the next day to retrieve our left belongings, we noticed two sets of tracks. One large, one small. These, my friends, belong to cats. Oh yes, one mighty big cat and her cub. The feeling I had in my stomach was not due to the beverages from the night before, but the feeling of cheating death. I drove to Peekskill in upstate New York with my wife to check on the property we had bought for our summer home. As we arrived at the entrance to a dirt trail leading to our land, I pulled the car off the highway and we both started walking towards the back of the property. The area was wooded and stretched about 300 yards before dropping off in a steep bank and continuing up the slope of the mountain or hill. We wandered around taking mental notes for our future house. As the sun began to set and darkness set in, we decided to make our way back to the highway, which was about a mile away. It was then that my wife called my attention to a light shining through the trees. In a particularly good mood and feeling calm and absent-minded, I didn't hesitate and started walking towards the light. We walked for about 200 feet until we reached a large rock. Suddenly, we noticed a shiny brassy-like object on the ground or slightly above it, accompanied by a figure standing next to it. We were both certain that the figure was that of a woman. For a brief moment, my mind seemed to go blank or numb, as I didn't feel afraid while trying to observe the figure. I wanted to take a peek inside the object, as its port or door was open. However, the interior appeared hazy or misty. Through the port, I could only make out a few glass-like rods with bluish spheres on their ends. There were also some black pipes visible. The top of the object had a brassy color, with a dimpled or hammered texture, while the bottom had a peculiar gleam similar to stainless steel dull and shiny at the same time. Pipes extended from the bottom of the top and went down to the edge of the object. The female entity standing nearby wore a black rubber-like hood that reached halfway down her back, and it seemed inflated as I could observe it pulsating or changing in size. The woman's fingers appeared unusually flexible as I thought I saw them bending in a wrong way although I couldn't be certain if it was due to the strange lighting. She held a tube in one hand, which connected to the port, and a black box with an attached wire in the other. Her face was covered by a plastic-like mask, and she wore goggles. The woman's eyes seemed luminous, shining through the dark goggles. It was at that moment that the realization struck me that this was not something to casually observe, and I began trembling like a leaf. My wife held onto my hand so tightly it hurt, seemingly frozen in place. I tugged at her, but she remained stiff as a board and wouldn't budge until I forcefully shook her. I half dragged her into the car, started the engine, and sped away from there. After driving for about three miles, I stopped to check on my wife. She was pale as a sheet, her mouth moving, but unable to form words. I restarted the car but found that I couldn't drive due to my feet and legs shaking uncontrollably. Later examination of the location revealed signs that a heavy oval object had been there at some point, or perhaps the area had been trampled over.
I was in the sixth grade when I had my first real encounter with the supernatural creature of Appalachia. I live on a small off-road in the middle of the woods. Only about 13 give or take houses are on my road, so it's quiet at night. When I was a child in Appalachia, I was taught things to avoid any supernatural confrontation, but it was bound to happen one day. Some rules that I learned were, never be out alone after dark if you see it, no you didn't if you hear it, no you didn't, things along the lines of that. It was January and I had gone over to my friend's house who was about three houses away from mine, so not far. But it was winter and the sun goes down early and I had lost track of time and it was six and pitch dark outside. When we realized how dark it was already, she offered for me to just sleep over since she knew there was a possibility of me running into a supernatural creature. But I insisted I just walked home. She then offered to walk me home so I wouldn't be alone. Again, I said no. So I went outside into the frigid icy air and walked home. I had my phone flashlight on so I could see a creature from far away in an emergency. I walked home as normal looking at the beautiful icicles and snow piles everywhere and thought, I'll be fine. I was wrong. My driveway to get down to my front door is steep and it goes down fast and at the end is the woods. It's woods for at least five miles back. I walked down slowly since there was ice everywhere and then I heard rustling in the bushes at the bottom of the driveway in the woods. I pointed my flash down and I saw a wolf, but it didn't look normal. Living in the Northeast, I see many wolves, but this one looked demented. Wolves won't strike at you or run up to you unless you provoke them, so I thought it would all be okay. I was about halfway down my driveway, and every step I took the wolf looked more and more demented. It had glowing eyes, and it was very big to just be a wolf. At that time, it started moving towards me fast. Another rule I learned as a kid was to never run from one of those creatures. But I did run. My front door was locked, but I had a key in my hand. It took me what felt like forever to unlock the key as it jiggled in the keyhole. My anxiety was so bad, and even though it was 20 degrees out, I was sweating like crazy. Finally, the door unlocked, and I ran in. There is a window right next to my front door, and I looked out the door, and there it was. A skinwalker shapeshifted as a wolf. Its eyes were beady and cold. It was hungry. I looked away, scared of what would happen next. After about a minute, it was gone, never to be seen again. Every night for about two months after that, I was spooked to even close my eyes to sleep. It got so bad I had to start taking melatonin. I'm mostly fine now, but here and there, I still feel like this wolf was watching me. It still spooks me to this day. That was my first ever encounter with a supernatural creature, but many were to follow after that one. I had many stories to share about these creatures, but that's for another time. When I was a teenager in early 2000s, South London, there was a rumor in my high school that there was a naked man who looked like Father Christmas in the woods. We relished that story, but all secretly understood it to be an urban legend. After school, me and my friends would go to the park five minutes away from the school to play on the tire swing and make daisy chains, talk about boys, etc. The park was on a seam of ancient woods. It was more or less a rectangular shape with a large rectangular grassy green in the middle surrounded by woodland on three sides. The grassy green had a children's playground on the right-hand side, budding up to the woodland on one side. The children's playground was large, with an assortment of equipment for both young and older children, and was gated off from the rest of the park by two meters high metal railings. One summer's evening after school, we were hanging out in the children's park by the tire swing, as we usually did, when I noticed an unusual movement in the trees that bordered the other side of the metal railing. All I could see was a mixture of green and brown tones amidst the shadows of the in the woodland, so I approached the metal railings of the children's park to get a better view. The woodland had a kind of opening in it, at the center of which stood a large old oak tree. Dappled light filtered through the canopy to the foot of the oak tree, forming a natural stage before the audience of children's playground. 
As my eyes began to focus, I realized that right in the middle of the stage was a young man, about 30 years old, stood staring at us. A group of three teenage girls in their school uniforms. Our eyes transfixed for a moment before I looked down and screamed. My eyes locked on him in terror, but he did not avert his gaze. He stood there, watching us, while completely naked, touching himself vigorously. My friends ran over to my side and followed my eyeline. Horrified, they grabbed me, pulled me out of my shock and out of the park, and we ran home. It was just before the time when mobile phones were ubiquitous, so we did not call the police and that was the end of the matter. But 20 years later, I always wonder if that man went on to do anything worse. There was another incident that happened a little while later, but I don't know if it was connected. I spent three months in northwestern Utah in 1999 doing graduate field work. I was alone for almost all of it. I read Lord of the Rings, played guitar, laid in the dirt staring up at the stars. Very fun. Anyhow, one night as I was sleeping, I heard a strange noise see edit below around 3 a.m. that jolted me awake instantly. I was in a tent and about 30 feet away from me. I heard a grunt that lasted about four seconds. Maybe it was a throat clearing. It was an animal noise. Most alarmingly, though, it had a definitely aggressive tone to it. It sounded like a challenge. There were no bears in the area, but mountain lions were possible, although quite rare. I didn't hear any of the insane mating calls for the three months. I sat bolt upright and grabbed my flashlight. I had no weapons with me other than a small knife, and that was somewhere with the cook gear. I waited, quiet as a mouse, for about 30 seconds listening for any noise. It was dead quiet. I could have heard anything, but not a single sound. As quietly as I could, but it sounded like when you're opening a bag of chips when you're trying not to make a sound, I positioned myself at the tent zipper, then suddenly yanked it open and shined the flashlight. Nothing. Then I bolted for the truck about 50 yards away. I made it and looked around with the flashlight. Nothing. It was out there watching me unless it ran away when I ran to the truck. I had the window cracked a bit and watched and listened for about an hour. Nothing. I laid down in the back and tried to sleep, but it was quite chilly and I was wearing only a pair of underwear and my huge scratchy wool sweater that was luckily in the back seat. The next morning I looked for tracks but saw nothing. And for the next six or so weeks I slept in the back of the truck. My younger brother was in his room carrying out a conversation which was weird because we were alone at home. I went to see who he was talking to. There was no one there, so I asked him who he was talking to. He said the little girl with the black eyes. I asked where she was, and he said that she had left. I thought he'd just lying. About a week later, we started hearing voices and footsteps. I would be sleeping with my blankets covering me, and I would wake up with them folded at the bottom of my bed. My sister got scared one night and crawled into bed with me. As she was getting into my bed, I woke up, so I turned on my TV. I also turned on my light to find the remote. I left the light on along with the TV. Right when we were both drifting off to sleep, my door slammed shut, which is almost impossible as I always have a basket full of books in front of the door so that it doesn't close. The light then shut off, and my TV picture went off with static noise. I got up and went to the door. I tried to open it, but it was like someone was holding the door handle from the outside. My sister and I started to scream when my mom came and opened the door. As she did, the light turned back on and the TV picture came back. We had a priest bless the house, but the activity continues. The house was built in 2003 and no one has died there. We need help. Once while I was trekking with my family up a mountain in India, there was no trail or anything we were just climbing. Once we reached the top, we saw this little hidden, almost stage-like area with a tree, a pool, and steps. Not that creepy, right? Except the entire tree was covered in old clothes. The pool was too, and also with toys and footwear. 
Not new clothes, but quite visibly worn ones. It looked like it had all happened in a hurry, but there were close to 200-250 clothing items there. It was so scary, we hightailed it out of there. When we returned to the hotel, we asked the staff about it. The manager said that the locals believe the fort on the other side of the hill to be haunted, and that there are various witchcraft cults in the area. He said never to go in the hills at night. This was the creepiest experience ever. A few years ago, I found myself sitting on the edge of a cornfield, shotgun in hand, early deer season. I wasn't there long before a group of does walked right up to me. Since I was just there for meat and not picky, I picked one out, set my sights on her shoulder, and pulled the trigger. It was a solid hit, and she fell as fast as she ran, only made it a dozen yards or so before collapsing in a twisted heap. Now the other four or five does that were with her ran in the same direction and stopped where she fell. They all just stood there, standing around her, looking down at her for a minute and trying to make sense of it. Then the danger they were in dawned on them and they all took off. I got up and walked over to the deer and sat down and stroked her fur. I had this kind of overwhelming feeling that I had shattered some sort of primordial ancient balance. I wasn't part of it all, I wasn't some predator stalking prey to survive, I was some guy who had come out to the woods to impose his will, and for no other reason that I just preferred the taste of meat. I wasn't starving, I felt like a bully. I had taken a gun and violently punched a hole in an animal clearly capable of thought and sentience, just because I felt like it. I sobbed as I got the deer and dragged her back to the truck. I took her home and she fed my family for a while. We made candles and soap from the fat and I donated the hide. But after that I was done. I realized then that even just going to the grocery store to buy a pound of burger was basically just the same, or even worse, since those animals never had a chance to live freely. So I decided that in good conscience I could no longer eat meat if I wasn't starving. I can easily sustain my life without it. And so I think I should do that. Suwon Air Base, 1989. There was an old ghost story about some security police Air Force MPS or some Republic of Korea Air Force MPS that were on duty near the end of runway when they freaked out because B-17s were landing at the base. Now at the time, we'd all heard the ghost stories of the B-17s at RAF. Lake and Heath, was it? I don't remember. All I remember was the story. Well, at the time, in order to complete a loop around the perimeter road, you had to cross the active runway, and there were ROK FSPS that guarded it so that no traffic would cross without clearance from the tower. My friend and I would walk this road at night, sometimes just for something to do, get a little exercise, whatever. One night on one of such walks, we got this fog rolling in. Unlike any other fog I've ever seen, like visibility was about five feet. Usually it was somewhere around 50 feet, but they would make us walk the truck's home lower ranking airmen walking the white line with a flashlight, usually a Lachlan laser in front of the truck. So the driver knew not to run off the road, drive into the other lane or run over said airmen. But I digress. The fog was bad and dead silence ensued. We had walked around to the entry control point where the Rockaf guys were stationed, and we shined our flashlights and presented our flight line clearance badges line badges to us. But we didn't expect them to let us pass because we would be walking on the active runway for a few hundred yards and besides. They never let us before, but we always tried anyway. Right in the middle of our plea to cross, we all heard planes. Prop jobs. Big ones. Not turboprops like the sound of a C-123 or C-130, but very distinct. Radial engines. And lots of them. Being that Air Force bases host a lot of air shows, you tend to be able to pick out certain engine types. And these were definitely not turboprops. I've only heard these engines on the old girls flying at air shows. Nothing should have been airborne in fog that thick. Even the mosquitoes were grounded that night. The two Koreans PS just looked at us, looked at each other, and then noped the F out. Left their shack, got into their truck, 
and drove off, leaving us standing there. We never saw anything, but we heard several large aircraft fly over the base in an approach pattern, but nothing ever touched down. Since we had not been told we couldn't cross, we went ahead and crossed the road and the active runway, shortening our walk to about a half mile back to the barracks. My friend and I never spoke about it. These events have never kept me from going back into the woods. The Keweenaw Peninsula in Michigan. Myself and a friend have a decently remote camping spot not far from Lake Superior. We've been going up there for 12 years, usually twice a year, once in the spring and once in the fall. On two such trips, both in the fall, our campsite has been stalked by wolves. They come within 30 yards of camp, always at night. You never hear them howl, you can just hear them walking through the brush. We've caught glimpses of them using those high-lumen battery-powered LEDs. They do not run when yelled at, which is scary as shit. It's kind of freaky sitting by a small campfire and have wolves come check you out. We never shoot at them, but two shots from a 44 mag and they never come back. We've also had bears wander into camp while we are sleeping. Loud, clumsy FS, not nearly as eerie or frightening. Yelling at them does the trick and they take off. In college, I spent one month house sitting a large hunting estate in the middle of nowhere, Idaho. The nearest town was 22 miles away. Woke up on the middle of the night to the sound of someone knocking loud and hard on the front door and the dogs were going nuts. No way I was going to answer it. I just grabbed the gun and kept quiet upstairs. Next morning, there was a car in the driveway. The guy who owned the car was found dead several months later. I have no idea what happened. Edit, I feel kind of bad. I should have put some more info in there. It was late last night. Here is everything I know. It was June 1987. I know it was 87 because it was the baseball season after the Bill Buckner disaster. My girlfriend's parents owned the place. It was in Southeast Idaho. I'm not going to say what town it was 22 miles from because they might still own it. And I don't want this to get more weirder than it already is. It was a pretty big place with a lot of acreage. The guy who was the full-time caretaker for the place had just quit. My girlfriend's dad went out there to find a new caretaker, but the new caretaker couldn't start for one month. Her dad offered to pay me dollar one of two hundred to go out there. Free food, satellite TV, one of those huge dishes from back then, and free booze. All I had to do was keep an eye on the place and feed the dogs and the horse. I had never been out west, so I took him up it. It sounded better than doing landscaping. I spent the time reading and exploring, playing with the dogs, riding the horse, shooting. Completely uneventful experience until that night. That night, after the knocking stopped and dogs stopped barking, I eventually went back to sleep. I didn't freak out all that much because there were two German shepherds inside with me, and I had a gun. I kept it on the nightstand. I had been drinking a little, but not drunk by any means. There were several neighbors that were a few miles away. I was kind of thinking someone just simply drove up the wrong driveway. Next morning at crack of dawn, I opened the front door to let the dogs out and see a white Chevy Nova sitting in the driveway. It was near the small cabin for the caretaker. The cabin was about 100 yards from the main house. I called my girlfriend's dad and asked him if he knew anyone with that make or model car and told him about what had happened the night before. He didn't know anyone and he called the police directly. Police show up, ask me a few questions and walk around the property for about an hour or so. The car was locked, the police had it towed. I have no idea if it was broke down or not. There was only one set of tire tracks coming into the house. A few days later, my girlfriend's dad called me up to say the guy who owned that car was missing and to call the police if anything weird happened again. I have no idea who the guy was at all. Don't know how long he was missing or when he was reported missing or who reported him missing. He was just missing. Girlfriend's dad didn't know that much. After one month, I go back home. Girlfriend and I break up shortly thereafter. 
I see her out on the town several months later, and I ask her if she ever found out what happened to that guy. All she knows is the guy was found dead by S 30 miles away. The S happened several months after that incident at the house, and he was found a couple of days after he had killed himself. I asked her how he did it, where he was he found, who found him, etc. And I got nothing. I never saw her again. You all now know just as much as I know. I feel your pain. In Yellowstone, a few weeks back, I listened to your podcast covering human and animal killings. Super creepy, especially if men are really being found killed like cattle. So of course I tell my hiking buddies all about the episode as the sun sets and really freaks them out. The night is nice, stars are out. The next day I came across a dead rodent right in the middle of the trail that looked to have all the signs of animal killings. Eyes are removed, there's a hole at the back of his head that appears to be black or burned. Eye sockets also have a black burned look to them. I obviously didn't check if his spine and organs were there but there was no blood and no insects on the body. Who knows if that was just like the work of bugs and sun, but I thought the timing was so stange. I have a video of this animal I'll upload later if I have time. But it is really strange because over thousands of miles I've seen plenty of dead animals in various states of decay, but this rodent looked perfectly preserved except it was missing eyes, and there was just that hole at the back of his head maybe half an inch wide that appeared blackened and cauterized or burnt. I've never seen this before and there's the timing of it all. Places totally have vibes to them. Some places that we walk through are straight up hair raising and I can never figure out why, yet I've confirmed it with other hikers. They'll usually ask, hey, did you feel weird back there? And they always go, yeah, I did. It just didn't feel right. One place in Utah comes to mind. It was a short day hike I did with my girlfriend in Kenyonlands NP. Forget the name, but the trail took you up the side of an old crater. I think they theorize it was a meteor strike ages ago, but don't really know. Anyway, we got to a spot, sat down, and were immediately overcome with this incredible lethargy to the point where we both wanted to fall asleep on that rock. I'm a pretty disciplined hiker, so I stood up and said we can't dally here. Oddly, I also had this gut feeling that we shouldn't fall asleep there. And also, weirdly, my girlfriend said offhand in a joking manner to some other day hikers coming up the trail. Be careful up there. There's a vortex that will suck you in and put you to sleep. She meant vortex in the hiker context of a town that'll suck you in and keep you doing unplanned zeros. But still, odd choice of language, right? And I'm reminded of cases of UFO and fairy abductions that start with people inexplicably falling asleep in the woods in the middle of the day. Speaking of weird places, the AT crosses through an area known as the Bennington Triangle. Going south, you'll cross over Glastonbury Mountain and then enter the town of Bennington. Apparently, there were four or five missing 411 style disappearances there in the 1940s. Google it. Really interesting stories. And the natives avoided the area because they believed devils lived on the mountain. When I walked through the day before I had written a blog post about how the trail was teaching me to follow my gut, and how following my gut always seemed to save me from storms and other things like that, and just generally turn out good. Well, this day I was planning to go through a small town called Manchester Center, then climb onto Glastonbury Mountain and camp on the mountain. In Manchester Center, I eat a burrito and have the worst stomach cramps I've ever had. Tried using the bathroom to wait it out, nothing. So book a room in a motel. Literally the second I've paid and get to the room, my stomach pain goes away. This was cramped so bad that I was walking hunched over that just disappeared in the matter of seconds. But I'd already paid, so I stayed. No diarrhea or anything that day. Everything 100% normal after I changed my plans. Climbed the mountain and went into Bennington the next day. Only after I realized that I would have been on the mountain on the night of the full moon. Is that relevant? No idea, but it just struck me as very, very odd how I wrote about following my gut. And then my gut literally forced me to not climb that mountain. Oh, on the way down is where the long trail and the ed intersect. 
and that intersection is where a young woman disappeared in the 40s without a trace. Weird. Now that I'm thinking of weird places with bad vibes, I'm reminded of this small five-mile loop I do at home in Missouri. When I walk this, I usually always stopped about three miles in and turned around. No real reason, that's just what I always did. Went in there maybe four years ago with an ex-girlfriend, and we ate about one 5G of shrooms each. The first hours of the trip were great hanging out about a mile into the loop. Then we decided to hike more and entered the section that I unintentionally avoided. It was so strange. The only way I can describe it is that it felt like evil descended on us. I'm getting goosebumps as I write this. I felt this deep pit of despair and depression come out of nowhere, and I just knew that that year was when I was going to die. I knew that our relationship was over. We both got real quiet and didn't talk for about half an hour. Then came to this ledge and I kept getting these horrible images of her running full speed charging off this like 80 feet ledge. Then all of a sudden the oppressive energy lifted and we both just burst out like, did you feel that what the hell? So she also felt that incredibly negative energy and felt that we were done. Our reactions were very interesting. We both felt like we should focus more on spirituality and develop a stronger spiritual base. I kept having the thought that the greatest lie is that there is no good and evil in this world. If you believe this, then you're truly vulnerable to true evil. So after this experience, we got into hypnosis a little. She could fall into trance very easily. One session I took her back to that day and she absolutely freaked. She said that we were attacked by a demon who attacked those who were undecided. Now I'm not religious at all and still am not and I think this is her Catholic upbringing coloring her experience, but I do think there was something very evil there that day in the woods. Also, it's fascinating that I just avoided that place intuitively right. Even with these experiences and all the content I listened to regarding the paranormal and missing 411, I don't feel at all threatened or in danger in the wild. I'd say 99% of my time out there, I feel as comfortable as if I were sitting on my couch at home. We were built to be in nature and the woods and the wild really are not a threatening place. Spend enough time out there and you truly will feel right at home. Night hiking alone is freaky at first, but like anything else you get used to it. It's very peaceful to just walk through the woods bathed in the little glow from your headlamp. It feels a lot like a voyage into another dimension. Funny enough I ended up getting off trail right when I hit New Mexico got gyrdia and ended up puking and shitting my guts out. Dropped from 178 to 162 pounds in under two weeks. It did make me wonder though if my gut wasn't protecting me again. Because New Mexico and the reservation lands are famous for their skinwalkers, and I did feel like I was kind of stirring up their attention by writing and talking about them throughout my trip. But none of these is even close to the greatest danger out there. I came the closest to death I ever have on trail right before I left. This was San Juan's in Colorado. We were pushing through late in the season, and we got three straight days of freezing rain. It was horrible. One night, everyone else got ahead of me, and I was pushing up a pass at 12.5 K feet, followed by a one-mile ridge walk at 12 K feet. Pushed over the pass right as the sun set and freezing rain started up again combined with winds that were blowing 40-50 miles per hour. I'm so incredibly cold at this point, but there's nothing that can be done about it but to keep moving. You can't layer up beyond your rain gear because anything else will just become soaked and useless. Then my glasses start freezing in the rain and I'm getting a horrible refraction glare from my headlamp that combined with the clouds and freezing rain enveloping the mountain top brings my visibility down to about a foot. Then I lose the trail, so now I'm just literally on the side of the mountain hiking on the side of some pretty steep grades. Steep enough that if I were to lose my footing I'd slide or fall dozens if not hundreds of feet and possibly off a cliff because those are certainly abundant in the San Juans. At this point, I can feel panic and bile at the back of my throat, but I know if I panic, I'm dead, so I just focus and keep moving in the direction where I think the trail is. Eventually, I see the light from headlamps up ahead, and it was my hiking buddies who were all huddled under a tarp. 
We never did make it to our intended campsite and instead had a sleepless night huddled under the big tarp, all trying to stay warm. I've never been so cold in my life. When we finally got to town, I realized feeling wasn't coming back into the tips of my fingers, and it took about a week before that numbness went away. Out of all the dangers in the wild, nature tops it all. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.